Come to Comedy 1025, 1063, the game streaming live on Twitter, Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook Live. We are live from the Busy Bee Plumbing, Heating, and Air Conditioning Game Nashville Studios. Today, we are live on this Fireball Hot Take Friday at the Jackalope Brewing Company out here in Wedgwood, Houston at uh 429B Houston Street. Because today at 5:30, they've got the unveiling of the Preds Pure Beer Mural. 5.30 right here at Jackalope Brewing Company. Appearances tonight by Nash, the Energy Team, the Preds Foundation, and 20% of Preds beer draft sales today will be donated to the Nashville Predators Foundation. And so they've got all kinds of stuff. they got a Preds playoff pride pickup during the Jackalope's tap room hours tomorrow from 12 to 11 p.m. they got a food truck from 4 to 9, and, of course, they'll be watching the game right here tonight, 7.30 with the puck drop Preds and the Chicago Blackhawks. Ian is here today. Hello, Ian. What up, what up? So uh, this morning, I was perusing the internet, as I, like many probably at this time of year, are want to do. And I was looking around, you know, who's saying what about the draft? Who's saying this about these rumors? Who's And ESPN has rumors for all 32 teams. I was really sitting there. I was like, rumors for all 32 teams? That means that they have to have a rumor about the Titans. And they did. Matt Miller, who's one of their NFL draft insiders or analysts or whatever, he's kind of stepped up to the plate more now that Todd McShay has been sent packing. Matt Miller says that the Titans, if Joe Alt is not available at seven, the Titans will be interested in trading down for Olu Fashnu or Talis Fuaga. Now, we haven't heard anything about Fuaga really, as far as the Titans are concerned, we've heard about Latham. We've heard, obviously, about Alt. And Fashnu, it seems like ever since they went to the Combine, we haven't heard anything about Olu Fashnu. At the beginning of this, it was like Alt 1A, Fashnu 1B. We haven't heard anything about that. So, again, the rumor is, hey, if Alt's gone, let, let's say Somebody jumps you. Last week in my Mach 1.0, I had a, the Chicago Bears trading up from the ninth pick to the fifth pick and drafting Joe Walt. Let's say that happens. Well, then they're saying that the Titans want to trade down and take Fashnu or Fawaga. But what is this season called, especially the month of April? What is it referred to as far as the rumors of the NFL draft are concerned? Ian, what do we call this month? I was going to say tax season, um, but uh, rumor, lying season, lying season. Lying season. So all I think about when I see that Matt Miller says, oh, they'd be interested in trading down, no problem, fash new, Fuaga, I'm like, "Uh uh-uh. In fact, Todd McShay, who had the same job last year, a week of the draft, had this nugget from the Houston Texans in his column, quote, This is where it gets interesting at number two. I've spoken to a lot of people around the NFL about the Texans and keep hearing Ohio State quarterback C.J. Stroud will not be the pick. It could all be a smokescreen, McShay writes. No, duh. But what's the benefit of spreading misinformation if Stroud is the pick? He also wrote at four about Indianapolis, quote, the Will Levis Colts buzz is very real, folks. In fact, If Levis is off the board, McShay wrote, I'm not sure what the Colts do. The only information I've heard on them this week is they're interested in Levis. And guys, I know Todd McShay. Todd McShay's not a liar. I'm just going to tell you this right now. But the people talking to Todd McShay were clearly, at that point in time, you guessed it, lying. Why? Because it's in the best interest of these NFL teams to lie. So when I see that the rumor is that the Titans are going to trade down if Alt's off the board, I think, okay, that is not what's happening. Now, they still may trade down, but they're not trading down for Fashnu or Fuaga. So here's my guess of what this all means. Joe Alt at seven is probably the most likely default option that the Titans have. I think we all know that. If he's gone, the Titans probably aren't looking to trade down for Fashnu or Fawaga. 
Because again, I believe that this info is bad info this time of the year. They're really probably eyeing either J.C. Latham if they're looking right tackle. We've heard, hey, Titans have liked J.C. Latham. Now we're starting to get to the point in time where it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, we're not hearing anything anymore about J.C. Latham. Or Troy Fatanu, the other left tackle prospect. Guy kind of scares me off a little bit because I think that he might be a guard. And I get scared about the idea of Mel Kuyper Jr. saying, this guy reminds me of Zach Martin of the Cowboys because that's what everybody said last draft about Peter Skaronsky. And then the idea of, well, I mean, I think he could be a good tackle, but he'd be a great guard. And then that freaks me out because that's what they've said about Skaronsky. And now you've burned the 11th overall pick on a guard, which, again, don't even get me started. But here's what I think is probably going to happen. I think the Titans are telling people, if our guy's not there, we're fine. We'll trade down, which means they probably won't. If Alt's gone, the the Titans are probably going to draft Malik Neighbors. Or they're going to be in the J.J. McCarthy sweepstakes, and then they're going to hold the bidding war for the quarterback. Because I think we have to assume that no matter what happens, and we're operating under the guise that Alt's gone by the seventh pick, If that's the case, three quarterbacks at least are gone. We know that. They're going to go one, two, three. Now, is the smoke real about McCarthy and the Patriots? I don't think so, but it doesn't matter. That's three quarterbacks. Then Marvin Harrison's off the board. You know, I saw Albert Breer saying today he thinks Marvin Harrison slips to six. Maybe, but Marvin Harrison ain't getting past six. So that's four guys now, three quarterbacks and Marvin that are gone. In order for Alt to be off the board, Alt has to be gone, which means of the first five players, now the Titans will be in position where when their pick comes up, one of the two receivers, Neighbors or Adunze, or the fourth quarterback will be available. And my guess is the Titans are probably looking at that saying, hey, Let's tell everybody, hey, you take our guy. It's not going to bother us at all. Because deep down inside, they want to take their guy. But if they don't take their guy, everyone says, well, we don't have to worry about the Titans. because they'll." And the Titans are probably sitting there saying, fine, we'll just take Malik Neighbors. Now, that makes me anxious because then I, I don't know who's going to play left tackle for the Titans. And that I don't necessarily like. But what I think I've learned about the Titans is that they're in a spot where they probably look at Joe Walt being gone as an opportunity more so than, oh, no, it's a bad thing. This is the only guy. Because it allows them to take the elite touchdown score, which is neighbors. It might allow them to get an even bigger haul than the one that I've brought up with Minnesota where you're trading for the two first-round draft choices and you're getting the fourth, but you're giving up 38. If McCarthy's there, and that's within striking distance where Denver and the Raiders can start floating out next year's one in order to get up and make that move, maybe that makes Minnesota say, okay, fine, we'll give you the two ones and we won't even take 38 back. But the last thing I think that's going to happen, it's like a parlay, right? There's a lot of things that could happen if Alt's not there. But the thing that I find the least likely is the info that's coming out that the Titans would be looking at a trade down for Fashnu or Fulwaga. And the only reason why I think that is the least likely thing to happen is because we are too close to the draft. When rumors start coming out this time of year, I say to myself, forget about it. Just completely dismiss it. It's not real. And what will happen is these insiders, whether it's Schefter, Rappaport, or Diana, or Charles, or whoever, these insiders will be told something. And they'll be convinced that they're being told the truth. And so, again, as Floyd used to always tell me, a reporter has one job. Ian, what's a reporter's job? To report. So if the general manager of the New England Patriots, Elliot Wolf, if he's telling a reporter, hey, we're going to draft Marvin Harrison with the third pick, what is the reporter supposed to do? He's supposed to report. So he's going to say, well, 
I'm hearing that the Patriots are really going three. And then every team in the league has to sit there and say, okay, what if this happens? What not what? So when the Titans are putting it out there, or at least sources are telling Matt Miller that the Titans are looking at a trade down for Fuaga or Fashnu, it makes me think that the Titans are absolutely not thinking of doing that, which then leads me to wonder, is Fashnu off their board? Or maybe not off their board, but do they not like Fashnu? Fawaga, we haven't talked a lot about him. We haven't really talked a lot about right tackle because left tackle is more important. But that's the thing now. If the name that's getting put out there is Fawaga, that's one thing. But Fashnu, you know, that's a big name around here. So that's how we're starting. Again, Todd McShay, the week of the draft. The one thing I can tell you, the Houston Texans are not taking C.J. Stroud. When it comes to Indy, if they don't take Will Levis, I don't know what they're going to do. And you know what happened last year. Folks, welcome to Lying Season. 615-737-1025 is our phone number. If you want to weigh in today on the program, 615-737-1025. And there was another person who floated out another rumor that makes me think that almost 99% confirms that I think this Matt Miller rumor is coming from the Titans, which makes me think that it's not true. We'll do that next. Stillman and Company, we are live again at the Jackalope Brewery, where once again today, that's 429B Houston Street, the ribbon cutting and the unveiling of the Preds Pure Beer Mural. Why do I keep screwing that up? It's not like I don't know the word beer. The unveiling of the Preds Beer Mural at 530 right here at Jackalope Brewing Company. Come on out and, of course, watch the game tonight, 730 here as well. Let's talk about FanDuel Sportsbook. FanDuel Sportsbook is my official sportsbook app. It needs to be yours too. It's almost playoff time in the NBA, the NHL, and baseball is in full swing, and FanDuel is your place to bet on every single one of those games. Because right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That is $150, win or lose. Bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks, all on an app that's safe, secure, and super easy to use. So what are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash JGM and make your first bet an automatic win. That's FanDuel.com, America's number one sportsbook, and of course, my official sportsbook app. 21 and over in present Tennessee. First online real money wager only. $10 first deposit required. Bonus issue is now withdrawable. Bonus bets expire seven days after. CC terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem called Tennessee Redline. 1-800-889-9789.
Yeah. Let's say the Chicago Bears are enamored with Joe Alt Jr. They pick at number mm-hmm. nine. And I'll just throw a, a trade out there. The Bears move up to number six in a deal with the New York Giants, and they select Joe Alt Jr. My question for you is, sitting there at seven, if you're the Titans, is there another tackle that you consider, I, I don't want to even say worthy because that's difficult, but as far as the right. draft goes, that has that type of, of earmark to it? Or is this at a point where... If Rand Carthen had indeed targeted Joe Alt Jr. and now he's off the board or Joe Alt, then what is the situation there? Is he moving out because there could be value at the tackle position in the early teens, maybe even a little bit later than that? What you know, is there anyone else that we can talk about here being worthy of that number seven pick? Yeah, that's that's the interesting part. And obviously I can't speak for Rand Carthon and his scouting department. But to me, it comes down to if you're not going, if Joe Alt's not available and you still want to have a tackle, I think the guys that are in consideration there, Olu Fashana, the tackle from Penn State, and Talise Fuaga, the tackle from Oregon State. Okay, that was Charles Davis on Sirius XM NFL Radio. And Ian, that I, I, help me out here. So Matt Miller at ESPN says that if the Titans, if Alt's off the board, he hears the Titans are looking to trade down for Fashnu and Fawaga. And now Charles Davis doesn't work at ESPN. I don't know if he knows Matt Miller. I don't know how well he would know Matt Miller. But they're not two guys who paths I see crossing very often. Charles Davis and Matt Miller. And Charles Davis just immediately answers. I think that was Alex Marvez right there. Just immediately answers Alex Marvez's question by saying, well, if you want to go tackle, the guys you can go with are Olu Fashnu and Thalys Fuwaga out of Oregon State. Like, wait a minute, what? So now one guy's saying those two players, and now Charles Davis is saying those two players. Does that not seem fishy to anybody else? And here's what I know about Rand Carthon. I know Rand Carthon has taken a liking to former players in his orbit. So guys that used to play for the Titans, Rand has become buddy-buddy with. Guys that have played in the NFL, buddy-buddy with. And Charles Davis calls Titan preseason games. And so I think there's probably a direct line there. And again, Charles Davis, it wasn't like... I mean, again, we've talked about offensive tackle for the last four months, maybe even longer than that. And the other options, I didn't hear Charles Davis or Matt Miller mention J.C. Latham, and that's a guy the Titans brought in this week for a visit. So if Charles Davis also thinks that the second options are alt or two alt are Fashnu and Fawaga, Do we really think that it's a coincidence that one of the ESPN draft geeks and Charles Davis highlighted the exact same people? And it takes me, again, what this does, forget about Fawaga, because I don't really care about Fawaga. It makes me wonder if Fashnu's off their board. Like, if there's something about Olu Fashnu, maybe it is the baby hands. Like, I know that you guys get all worked up every time somebody goes to the combine and they don't run a fast enough 40. And then you tell me that I don't care how fast a guy runs in his underwear. I won't see a guy with his pads on. And every time I'm like, look, that's great. But I used to do the show with an old football general manager, and he cared about that stuff. Like, you could say it didn't matter, but I'll tell you, a guy who used to make these picks, he cared about that stuff. And so Fashnu goes to the combine, and they measure out the baby hands, and all of a sudden, it's like, we don't hear much about them. And now the Titans are telling people, oh, yeah, we'll just trade down for Olu Fashnu. And again, if the Titans are telling people they'll trade down for Olu Fashnu, then the one thing that I almost feel certain is going to happen is that they are not going to trade down for Olu Fashnu. And if they're not going to trade down for Olu Fashnu, and they're just immediately going to rule that out, that means he's either off their board or they don't think of him as highly as everybody else does where everybody sees him as like a top 14 prospect. And then it makes me wonder, okay, who are the guys they're really hiding here? If they're telling Charles Davis, and again, I think this is Rand, I think it is a direct line. Just knowing how Rand has taken 
to former players like Charles Davis. I wonder if Rand has said, hey, these are the two guys, these are the, the three guys we really like. Alt, because everybody knows you like Alt. Alt, Fulwaga, and Fashnu. And then everybody starts talking about Fashnu and Fulwaga. And really, they like Amarius Mims out of Georgia. Or really, they like J.C. Latham out of Alabama. That's what I'm starting to think about. Again, these two dudes, and maybe they're best buddies, and I just, I, I don't know anything. I, no way of connecting it. Like how Gill and A.J. Malesko, and how they're best buddies. And you wouldn't know that if you didn't know it. Like, maybe they're best, but I don't think they're best buddies. And again, Charles Davis literally just said the exact same thing Matt Miller said. And I don't think Charles Davis is waking up every morning going to ESPN.com to see what Matt Miller wrote. So it makes me think they might be out on Fash New, which I find to be a little surprising, just given what we've heard about Fash New. Phone lines driven by WilsonCountyHunday.com at 615-737-1025. We are live again from the Jackalope Brewing Company out here at 429 B. Houston Street for the ribbon cutting and the unveiling of the Preds Beer Mural 530 today. Adam in Portland is going to kick us off on a Fireball Hot Take Friday. Thank you for calling and waiting. Go ahead, Adam. Man, I think you're uh, too paranoid. I-, I think you're going to make the best old guy in the world, like the conspiracy theorist, the old guy who thinks that just everybody and every system in the world is lying to us, and he's figured it out. Like he knows the insider trades, and you think they're you telling know, the like, truth help- this time of year? I, no, but posturing is a thing. It doesn't mean you're a liar or a piece of crap just because you posture a little bit. Like, no, did I say how, that? How- how hard would you hit these people if they were like, hey, we're picking Joe Alt, and then we never hear anything except Joe Alt's name at seven? You're not supposed to. Like, you're not supposed to know the Why plan. Are but I feel like, Why I feel are you like mad at you me? Why are you mad at me? I've heard it, and I've, I've heard it ramp up in your voice the last couple of weeks, too. Like, I figured these guys out. And you do it this time of year. You get so paranoid where you're like, everybody here's a liar. But, and I, I heard Floyd that day when everybody he was like, Everybody this hey, yeah, time of year is lying. Liars. I get it that they're all, but it doesn't make them like. I think I think you just feel like you you got like a did leg up Adam, on these dudes when it's Adam, not. Adam, hush for a second. Dude. Did I say that? Did I say that it makes them bad guys for lying this time of year when everybody is lying two weeks ahead of the draft? No, but I don't necessarily think it's lying, man. That's that's the point. It is like, absolutely not- lying. It's poker. That's what it is. Thank you, Adam. It's absolutely what it is. It's poker. It's like they're trying to make you think that they've got a hand. Maybe they do. Maybe they don't. You don't know. And if a poker player lies at the table about what he has, I'm not going to sit there and think, boy, I'll tell you, he violated one of the Ten Commandments. God is going to smite him. I don't think that. It's That's business. This is the NFL again. I told you. Todd McShay reported last year what he was hearing. And, again, he goes to – all the, you know, he goes to the combine, he goes to the pro days when he was at ESPN, he goes to all these things, and he's talking to scouts, and he's talking to personnel directors, he's talking to GMs, and he's like, the thing I've heard is that the Indianapolis Colts are taking Will Levis no matter what. And Ian, did I not say last year that I knew they wanted Richardson over Levis, not because of any sourcing, but just because of how much ESPN kept reporting that they wanted Will Levis? Sounds about right. They just kept saying, I'm like, okay, every ESPN reporter is like, they love Will Levis because the Colts told them they loved Will Levis. Well, why would the Colts tell everybody they love Will Levis? Because they like Anthony Richardson. And what they don't want to do is they don't want to have to trade up to number two or number three in order to wait to get Richardson. But if somebody knows they love Richardson, somebody may try to jump them. And they don't want that. And so I'm. it's not like it's not a knock on your character if you lie this time of year. And it's not paranoia. It's not conspiracy theories. It's, a, it's none of that. It's the reality of the lead up to the NFL draft. I mean, Mel Kuyper Jr. talks about it all the time about things he's hearing. I mean, I'm hearing it right now and I just don't know if, what to believe and what. Not. That's what that's the point. Floyd told me a story that one time he got a call and it was Chris Berman, Boomer. And Boomer called him and he picked up the phone. And I guess he was at a hotel somewhere. Boomer was at the same, maybe it was the combine. I don't know. Boomer calls him. 
at his hotel phone, picks up the phone, and Boomer starts asking him, is it true that you really, really are thinking about trading out of this pick? And, and Floyd realizes right away that Chris Berman had called the wrong person. And he says, well, I'm not sure exactly. What else are you hearing? And Boomer talks a little bit more. And then finally, Boomer says, is this Dan Reeves or is this Mike Shanahan or is this whoever the hell he starts? Floyd goes, no, it's Floyd Reese. He said, oh, I'm sorry. Hey, by the way, what are you thinking about? Like, that's, that's the trade. You know, the late, great John Clayton, Floyd used to always say he had the best information. And what he meant by that was that John Clayton was the guy who was probably able to extract the most truthful information out of all these guys. And so he would trust John a little bit more than other guys. And look, I've said all kinds of stuff about Rand Carthon, about not believing whether or not he's a good general manager. This is not going to change my opinion. You guys get mad at me like you always do. But let me say this. If Rand Carthon was lying to every person out there right now, I wouldn't have one problem with it. In fact, I'd encourage it. That's the job. So don't call up all mad being like, oh, yeah, you're saying they're liars. Everybody lies this time of year. That's the point. 615-737-1025 is our phone number, 615-737-1025. So I hear a lot of talk about people saying, you know, well, you, you know, Will Levis, is he, what's he got to do to be a leader? And what's he got to, you know, all this like, you know, TV talk kind of stuff. But I heard a former NFL general manager break down Levis. And he said the one thing that Will Levis absolutely positively needs to figure out how to do. And this is the $200 million question. We'll get to that next. Stillman and Company, we are live today, hanging out here at the Jackalope Brewery again, once again, at 530. The Preds Pure, Pure Mural will be unveiled. Hey, tune in to 94.9 The Fan this Sunday for coverage of the Auto Trader Echo Park Automotive 400. Coverage will begin at 1.30 with the race starting at 2.30. Coverage also available on the 94.9 The Fan app and at 94.9thefan.com.
it's just from what I've what I've seen so far, and again, I'm still learning. Will every day that goes on, but he's he's got an intensity and an intent to every time he walks in the building. Um, that's I think you see that in his play. When you watch him play, you see that uh, intensity, that fire that he's got. Um, that's not uh, manufactured. That's how he is. Um, he's got a way about him that is um, driven. I think he wants to be a great player. Um, and he puts the requisite work in. That part's been uh, fun to see. Just as you see him in the off season, he's he went out to California uh, to work with some people. He's he's very uh, determined to improve his game, and I think that part you have that part. You got a chance to do a lot of really cool things. But I've seen that from him in this early portion. Uh, he is he is front and center. He takes notes. He asks questions. He does all the things you'd want to see early in the process of a guy that's trying to um, improve his game and get better. So far, so good. That was Brian Callahan talking about the Titans signal caller, which, by the way, somebody texted in and was like, Will Levis is at the Masters. I'm like, I, okay. Okay, so whatever. But I do think it's funny because a lot of people are like trying. Everybody wants to know whether or not Will Levis is going to be the guy. That's all everybody wants to know. And there may be like little ways, you know, do you think he's got the leadership? Because that's a box that has to be checked. Do you think he's got this? Do you think he's got, do you? But really, everybody wants to know, can Will Levis be the guy? And the people that are still turned off by the mayonnaise and the coffee, they will not watch him play. They will not adjust their opinions at all. And that's fine. Who gives a rat's ass what they think? But I really want to know, okay, what does Levis have to do in order to make it? You know, we know the Titans have to do their part, right? They have to get a line to block for him. They've got to get a coach that knows quarterback play. It looks like they've got one, but a coach that can teach him, that can get through to him. They got to get some receivers for him to catch the ball. They went out and got Calvin Ridley, which was good. Maybe they add another receiver for him. They got to do their part. But then there's what Levis has to do. And there's the choices that Levis has to make, right? Like the commitment to the team, which it sounds like he's made. But then there are the things that you can work as hard as possible and either you get it or you don't. And Bill Polian, former NFL general manager, Hall of Fame Bill Polian, was on Sirius XM NFL Radio, and he was asked what the second-year quarterbacks need to do. For instance, he said that Bryce Young needs to work on his footwork and that the first thing he said Levis needs to do is not take all those hits in the running game, which I agree with. But here's what he said Levis really, truly needs to be able to do in order to take the next step. I think his mechanics are fine. He needs a a little bit better timing and footwork, but I think that'll come. And then he didn't play enough last year to learn how to recognize defenses and blitzes. I keep coming back to blitzes. Not enough people focus on this. Recognition of the blitz is what the quarterback has to do. It's critical. Otherwise, he's going to get himself killed. He's going to get sacked, and he's going to turn the ball over. Mm -hmm. And what happens is the first couple of times they get sacked, they say, whoa, enough is enough. (laughs) The ball is coming out fast. (laughs) And once that happens, now interceptions follow as sure as night follows day. So. You have to learn to recognize the blitz and get into the right protection and get into the right play. Okay. Is he going to be able to do that? I don't know. That's your $300 million question. If Will Levis can do that, if he can get out there and he can read the blitz and he can look and say, okay, this guy's dropping here, this guy's going there, that's going to be open. If he can do that, he's going to be a franchise quarterback. Because he's got the talent, he's got the work ethic. I mean, I sat down with him at the Super Bowl. I can tell you this, he's a good kid. You know, he needs to chill out a little bit. You know, sometimes I watch him throw the football in these games. When the game starts to get out of reach, like that Pittsburgh game at the end, or Tampa Bay, you know, when they started to pull ahead, and he's like, I got to get it all back on one play. And he's got to chill out with that. That should come with experience. But whether or not he can pick up the blitz, and he can stand in the shotgun or he can stand under center and see something and go, that's the guy right there. That is the difference between him being a $300 million quarterback and him being a guy that, you know, 
it's too bad it didn't work out. And I don't have the answer to whether or not he's going to do that. And I think they've got the right coach for him to be able to help him learn these things. But just because Brian Callahan knows how to do it doesn't mean that he'll be able to transfer that knowledge into Will Levis in live time. You know, my parents spent about a week at my house this past winter. They were doing some work on their house, and so they spent a week at my house. I do not have direct TV, which they have, but I do have the direct TV app. So I, you know, they logged in with their credentials. And so they're, I showed my mom how to use the direct TV app within about three hours. I think I left for work and came back after the show. And my mom was a wizard on the direct TV app. She was like basically a blackjack dealer, you know, just spitting the cards out, get into the next channel, record this, move that, everything. I've shown my dad 800 times how to use the direct TV app. And every time he stares at me with these dead ass eyes, like, okay, so now how do I get back? I'm like, been over this a thousand times. And I love my dad and he's no dummy. But I just, in my heart, feel like he's never truly going to be able to grasp the direct TV app. The blitz with a quarterback sometimes can be the same thing. Now, I think Levis is smart enough to be able to figure this stuff out because everybody I've talked to says he is. You know, Liam Cohen, who was his offensive coordinator at Kentucky, he told me that Levis is a great student and that Levis' academic advisor from Penn State came to Indianapolis to watch him throw in the combine. So it gives me hope. But those are the answers that nobody knows. And everybody wants to know. Everybody wants to know whether or not Levis is the guy. Because if the answer is going to be no, then it's like, well, let's not waste any more time. Let's go get somebody else. Let's do this. Let's. And if he is the guy, then it's like, all right, build this team around him and let's get excited and let's. And the reality is in the NFL. It takes time to find out. Polian also talked about his, you know, his, how long it takes for a quarterback to develop. And it's funny because I've talked about this a lot about how Floyd talked about the five-year plan. Polian has something very similar. It's not exactly the same, but Polian says year one for a quarterback, they just got to be able to get in and out of the huddle, right? Like, hey, man, can you play quarterback within the 40 seconds, get the play call in there and do what the coach tells you to do and get the guys lined up and everything else? which is a lot more complicated than it probably looks. Year two, he's got to start to read the defenses. And again, that comes back to the blitz. You know, the coach can put in the play, but if they've dialed up a blitz, you got to see that, and the coach may not be able to tell you that ahead of time. Like, it may be out there, you better see it, and you better check to it, or else you're going to get crushed. Year three, Polian says, you have to learn to use the offensive players you have. And he used Mahomes as an example, saying he learned very quickly, okay, throw the ball deep to Tyreek, get the ball short to Kelsey. You know, at some point, Levis is going to have to learn, okay, this is what he does well, this is what he does well. That's year three. Year four is learning how to attack the defense, so using your eyes, tricking defenses, you know, not just taking what they give you, but exploiting them. And then year five is running the whole show where you can get a minute out of the huddle. You can work the play. You can come up with the game plan. You can sit there and say, okay, all right, if they're going to line up in this, then we're going to check to that. You know, basically holding guys accountable, saying, I want you to do this. I need you to do that. That's year five. Well, right now, Levis is at the stage where he's got to be able to read the defenses. And if anybody's going to tell you, oh, he can do it, then they're wrong. Just as the guys that are mad about the mayonnaise and the coffee and think, oh, no, he sucked at Kentucky. He's a bum. Those guys are wrong, too. There's no way to know. 615-737-1025 is our phone number. If you want to weigh in, 615-737-1025 here on our program. We'll get to your phones. Again, we are live today at the Jackalope Brewery where they are at 530 unveiling the brand new Preds Beer mural so be very excited about that apparently this uh collaboration came about at their annual p 
Peach Yourself Party last July, and the Preds Foundation was their nonprofit of the month of July. Every month, Jack Jackalope has a nonprofit that they donate 20% of their draft beer sales to. And they asked if they wanted to be involved in this day, which they decided they did. So you got the Preds beer and everything else, so be excited about that. 615-737-1025. Let's talk about Window Nation. That's right. I had Window Nation out to my home, and I got the free in-home estimate. And I said, tell me what windows I need to have upgraded. They said, your windows are fine. And at that moment, I learned that this was a very trustable company. Because if they were going to come into my home, and they were going to take time out of their day, and they weren't going to make a sale out of it because it was in the best interest of me and my home, that's how I know you can trust it. And with April being here, if your windows won't open for fresh air or seal tight to keep out the pollen and the bugs, talk to my friends at Window Nation. Right now, for every two windows you'll buy, you'll get two windows free. And there is no limit on how much you could save. Plus, you could save even more with no interest or payments for 24 months. With that proven quality, you'll get affordable windows that meet or beat those national brands. So do not miss out. Again, for every two windows you'll buy, you'll get two free and no interest, no payments for 24 months. Call 866-90-NATION or visit windownation.com. Again, that's 866-90-NATION, windownation.com.
Let's talk about football just a little bit. And it was so fun to watch you have success in your first season as an NFL quarterback. The Titans have done some really nice things to surround you for success next season. A coaching change, though, some things will be different. What's your outlook going into next year? It's exciting. It's yeah. really, really cool. I mean, uh, an opportunity to really make my mark as a leader, too, which is exciting. Um, new offense to learn, which is something, you know, I've done in the past that I just got to grind and, you know, get down. And other than that, it's, you know, being the guy in the locker room that I need to be and bringing everyone together to make sure that, you know, with this new staff and the new additions that we're making and that our ownership is, you know, the decisions they're making and what they see going forward with the team. It's really, really exciting and excited to do my job. There you go. That was Will Levis at the Masters today. Very well said. You know, the, oh, I'm excited to be a leader here. I'm excited to, you know, that's good TV talk. I think the thing that I'm thinking about when it comes to Will Levis, what I'm excited to see out of him is I'm excited to see whether or not Will Levis makes the jump where he really eliminates some of the stupid stuff from last year. You know, and and I think one of the, the stupider things, you know, the way that he risks his body, that's got to stop. That is a conscious choice. That is very easy. There is a, hey, just calm down. You know, the idea of like, let's see Levis and whether or not he can lead and all that'll come. And I think Brian Callahan did a great job this week of kind of articulating like Levis got to do his job. And by doing his job, then that will show that he can lead. In fact, I think most leadership qualities to me, this is what a leader is when when somebody is young and developing. A young leader leads by example, where it's like. That guy just goes out and busts his tail to the point that everybody says, man, that guy is relentless. Guy's working so hard, which it sounds like that's what Levis is. Not walks in day one's like, all right, guys, I'm quarterback. That's not what you do. You can do that if you're a veteran and you've got the skins on the wall. And even then, you still got a performer, else you're Russell Wilson. But I do think that kind of, you know, it's a just showing up every day and, putting in the work, and then at that point, if you get things right, you can hold others accountable. But I, I think that was more just kind of generic talk than it was about, yeah, I'm really excited to get into how Brian Callahan wants us to try to attack uh, this kind of front kind of talk. One texter says, I might be wrong, but I feel like Levis did a pretty good job at reading defenses last year too. I mean, he wasn't perfect, but he wasn't horrible at all. On top of the story of him studying the hell out of the playbook in his hotel room last year, I think he should be fine. I disagree. I do not think Levis did a great job of reading defenses. And just some examples that came to the top of my mind. The Pittsburgh game, you know, once he got on his heels there at the end of the first half, like they took the ball out of his hands because he was making some bad decisions. And then when they got to the point where the Steelers took the lead and they had to throw the ball you know, Levis threw almost two interceptions, one in which DeAndre Hopkins kept out of, you know, harm's way with a great defensive back play by DeAndre. Then there was a ball that should have been intercepted in the end zone, and then the next throw was intercepted in the end zone, and it's like, dude, you got to read that better. Like, you can't just YOLO ball it because you want to. I mean, the Dolphins dropped the defensive lineman on him that ended up with a pick six. And then Levis, when the guy was in the end zone, decided to lower his shoulder into a 330 pounder and just out of frustration, fire one on the guy. And again, that can get you hurt. That's the stupid stuff that needs to go. I mean, I don't think Levis is a dummy by any stretch of the imagination. And I think Levis will pick this stuff up. But to sit there and say like, oh, I, I think he already reads defense as well. I don't think so. But I don't think he's... I don't think he's supposed to do that. One texture says Lloyd Cushenberry should help him evaluate these kind of things dealing with the defenses. I agree. This is where we are in the stage of Will Levis's development. Right now, the Tennessee Titans owe it to Will Levis to do everything possible in order to help him. And whether that is by getting him a Calvin Ridley that can run so he can throw the ball down the field as opposed to some of the guys, you know, that well, Traylon Burks, you know, that's a four, five, five, right? NWI, he can't run. Like, get him a guy that can run so that he can unleash the cannon. That helps him. Get him a center that isn't 270 pounds. That will help him. 
I think right now that's what all these things are. And then once Levis becomes that guy, if he becomes that guy, then you pay him $200 million. Now it's his job to carry the team, which is exactly where Josh Allen, for instance. That's where Josh Allen is right now. Stephon Diggs ain't there anymore. The veteran center was making $11 million bucks. They didn't want to pay him. They said, oh, no, we can take this young guy and make him the center. Well, now that's Josh Allen's job to, get, to, to be able to get him to get the center on the right page. They're going to draft a receiver in the first round. It's Josh Allen's job to get that guy to be a big-time player. That's the whole, that's how this entire thing works. Just like when it comes to the the Chiefs, like now it's Mahomes' job. Like, hey, we're going to give you a bunch of bums. It's your job to get them to work. One texture says, we have no idea how Levis will work out, but I don't see him as a starting NFL quarterback looking at the totality of his work. My guess is another injury game in five and out for the season. I think Mariota is beginning to look better than Will Levis. See, that's just somebody who's already made up their mind. Like, Ian, I was all in on Anthony Richardson, right? Sure, yeah. Told you I would have traded up for the number Loved one him. pick last year. For Anthony Richardson. Anthony Richardson got hurt last year. I have no idea. You know, I see these rankings and stuff, and they're like, oh, yeah, you know, Anthony Richardson is the 13th best quarterback. And I'm like, how how do you know that? And so I want to be right, but I have no idea if Anthony Richardson is going to make it or not. I have no idea if Anthony Richardson is ever going to learn to take care of himself or if he thinks he's going to be able to run the ball like he's in college. So when you tell me when it comes to Levis that you know he's not going to work, I'm going to push back on that. And when you tell me that you know Levis is going to be a superstar, I'm going to push back on that. Because there is no way to know. We are at that juncture, right? It's like somebody has a newborn. I think he's going to go to Harvard. There is no way for you to know that. 615-737-1025. Kentucky's hired a basketball coach. And while that's great, and Kentucky fans last night were going crazy at the news that they had hired Mark Pope, I am way more excited about the brewing feud that I think may be the story of the SEC, maybe the story of college basketball. We'll do that next here on Stillman and Company. Score big with Lee Company this spring in the National Predators in the 10K Power Play giveaway. Enter for a chance to win a Kohler home generator or $10,000 towards Lee Company home services. Go to leecompany.com slash giveaway to enter. That's leecompany.com slash giveaway. And uh, all entries are accepted until Saturday, April 20th.
Stillman and Company, 1025, 1063, the game streaming live on Twitter, Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook Live, live from the Busy Bee Plumbing, Heating, and Air Conditioning Game Nashville Studios. That's Jackalope Brewing Company today. We're the Preds Foundation, Nash, the energy team, all going to be out here for the ribbon cutting and the unveiling of the Preds Beer Mural at 5.30 today, right here, Jackalope Brewing Company at 429B Houston Street. We're excited to be here with our friends. And I have had the Preds beer before. Ian, have you had the Preds beer yet? No, not yet. It's not bad. Oh, I'm I sure I would like good. it. And you know, you would love it. I'm mm-hmm. not a beer drinker, but I mean, the Preds beer is legit. Sounds and it delicious. is a Fireball Hot Take Friday. So we got a little breaking news. It's, it's not a big transaction, but it is a big transaction to me. So the Titans have acquired Leroy Watson. No relation to Leroy Jenkins. But the Titans have acquired Leroy Watson, a tackle from the Cleveland Browns, for pick number 227, which is a seventh-round draft choice in this year's draft. According to the Titans' release, Watson played in seven games last year, no starts. In 22, he was on the practice squad in San Francisco after signing as a UDFA with Atlanta. He apparently had three seasons at Texas San Antonio, so hold on, let me. I'm gonna send a text message here, Ian, to uh, a source of mine mm-hmm. who coached at Texas San Antonio. Just gonna say Leroy Watson. Question good. Question mark. All right. So again, it sounds on the surface like it's a Scarbini tackle for a seventh round draft choice, right? Not a big deal. But here's why I like this acquisition. First off. From what I've heard, from what it sounds like, you know, Jim Nagy, the guy that runs the Senior Bowl, has been making a big deal about this. The depth of the later rounds in this year's draft, specifically day day three, rounds really five, six, and seven. It is not going to be a typical round five, six, or seven. Because what's happened is a lot of guys that would normally go to the NFL and be drafted in rounds three and four have come back to college because there's more money with NIL for them to do that than there would be necessarily to be drafted in the fourth round. So they go back to college. Well, now guys that would originally be in the fifth and the sixth rounds are going to be kicked up to the third and the fourth round. And so because of that, you know, there's this idea that really these seventh round draft choices are basically just going to be guys that would typically be UDFAs. Well, If the Titans are acquiring a guy that played seven games for the Cleveland Browns last year on the offensive line, who knows this guy? Ian? Big coach. Big coach, Bill Callahan. And I've asked the question, when it comes to the decision-making on the offensive line, specifically in the draft, how are they going to go about evaluating and deciding? Well, I don't want to crap on the Titan Scouts because I don't know the Titan Scouts, and I don't want to crap on the Kevin Turkses and the Brian Gardners and all those guys because they, I'm sure they're fine guys. But those that's John Robinson's crew. Like, those are John Robinson's people. So if it's like, well, the Scouts think this tackle or that tackle, they're the same Scouts that brought you Isaiah Wilson and Dylan Radins and every, you know, the misses that they've had in the past. Well, Bill Callahan is probably the only scout that's involved in this one. Where I'm sure big coach probably said like, hey, I liked working with him. He's got some traits. He's got some things we can coach up. You know, he could be a depth guy for us. And a depth guy for you could be Dennis Kelly, right? Like it could be, I mean, I don't think Bill Callahan saying, hey, Let's waste a pick, even if it's not a premium pick. Let's waste a premium pick on some bum who's not going to come in here and really have a shot at making this team. And so, you know, everybody wants me to believe in Sadiq Charles, right? You know, this guy that every met, you know, pro football focus says he sucks. The Washington beat writers say he suck, you know, from what they wrote on him. What was the one article we saw when they signed Sadiq Charles that was like, 2023 proves that Sadiq Charles is a bust. You know, something like that. Well, if Bill Callahan is the guy who said him, then I feel okay about it. And where, where again, this really matters to me. It doesn't matter to me about the two and a half million for Sadiq Charles or trading a seventh round draft choice, pick 227 
you know, in order to get this guy. Where it really matters to me is when they're sitting there saying, okay, Joe Alt's gone. Now we're on the clock. Now we got to make this pick. We got to decide, you know, hey, let's trade back to nine. Atlanta wants Malik Neighbors. So does Chicago. Chicago is offering next year's two to move up in order to take Malik Neighbors from nine. Do we do it? Or do we say, you know what, hey, but if Bill Callahan's sitting there saying, hey, I've evaluated Amarius Mims, and I know he only played seven games at Georgia, and I know he was a right tackle, but he reminds me of Tyron Smith when I was in Dallas, and we flipped him to the left side, and a big, strong, athletic left tackle, and he's got that in him. And so I think, like, yes, that, yes. If that's the case, then I feel very confident. Like, it makes me feel good that they're relying on a legitimate expert in order to make these decisions. So it is a good sign that they are banking on that expert. And then maybe that means that when they're on the clock at 7, that they'll bank on this expert. And if you had to tell me, hey, man, you've got a choice of trusting the John Robinson scouting crew that brought you Dylan Radins, or you can trust Bill Callahan, a.k.a. Big coach. Big coach, who, again, you know, we can talk about what Bill Callahan seen on the tape about Nicholas Petit Frere, a.k.a. P.T. P.T. or Jalen Duncan or whatever. It's, oh, they got some traits we like a little bit here. But he hasn't had his hands on him. He's had his hands on this guy. So I'm not going to, you know, again, I'm not going to just go crazy about a seventh-round tackle. Guy might not even make the team. But my guess is, is that if Bill Callahan wants him, then he's probably going to end up making the team because Bill Callahan probably knows what he's capable of. And uh, some people are texting in. One person texted me. Some person texted the text line. says he was on the 49ers practice squad in 2022, so Rand Carthon knows him. I mean, I guess. I don't get excited. I mean, Rand Carthon brought you the guard with the 11th pick that we don't even know is good, and Jalen Duncan. So I'm not going to get excited about that. But I also, not how much hands-on do the personnel guys have about practice squad guys? Whereas, if this guy was on the Cleveland Browns last year for every game during the season, then that means he was one of eight guys or ten guys in the meeting room every day on the practice field with Bill Callahan. So it shows me that they're relying on Bill Callahan, and that in itself Gets me excited. 615-737-1025 if you want to weigh in on that. Corey Curtis, News 2, will join us. We got to go through some of these draft scenarios with Corey, get his opinion on them. And also, you know, a lot of people are really mad at me about something that I'm not sorry about. I do want Corey's opinion on that as well. So we will do that coming up next. FanDuel Sportsbook is my official sportsbook app. That's right. And it is playoff time in the NBA and NHL and baseball is in full swing. And FanDuel is your place to bet on every game. Because right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150 win or lose. You can bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks, all in an app that's safe, secure, and super easy to use. So what are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash JGM and make your first bet an automatic win. Again, that's FanDuel.com slash JGM. FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook and my official sportsbook app. 21 and over in present in Tennessee. First online real money wager, only $10 first deposit is required. Bonus issues, double drop bonus bets that expire seven days after a CC terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call the Tennessee Redline 1-800-889-9789.
Tune in to 93.3 Classic Hits today as the Sounds take on the Memphis Redbirds on the road for a doubleheader pregame at 450, first pitch at 505, with coverage also available at 93.3ClassicHits.com. Sounds Baseball, presented by Twin Peaks Family Leisure, Busy Bee Plumbing, Heating, and Air Conditioning. So, I, uh, you know, as we're live here out at the Jackalope Brewery where they are unveiling the Preds Beer Mural today at four thirty, at 530, excuse me, I have made a lot of people mad because I... Listen to what Brian Callahan said about Traylon Burks and I heard, or I guess I should say what he didn't say about Traylon Burks. And I took that to mean something when he's talking about receiver depth and he mentions Mason Kinsey, but he doesn't mention Traylon Burks. That is telling. And again, I saw the pictures to me. To me, it looks pretty obvious Burks has gained some weight. Now, whether that's a good thing, I couldn't tell you. I mean, people get mad at me for that. I'm just telling you, that's what it looks like to me. And when the coach ignores the guy when talking about receivers, that is a red flag. Corey Curtis joins us now on the program from News 2. Corey, do you see that? You were at that press conference when Brian Callahan decided not to mention Traylon Burks. Do you see that as a red flag for the third-year whiteout? Well... Look, I'm, I try not to overreact to one thing. Um, but, yes, he did not get mentioned, and I think we can take note of that. I think we need more to support it than just one offhanded comment where he was not mentioned. I think, and I know other people are probably going to disagree with me, I think you saying that Traylon Burks is overweight based on the pictures you've seen of him are ridiculous. I, I, I don't see th- I mean, I don't see that at all. I've seen several pictures of him and I, I don't see where I go, man, he's out of shape. I, I just don't. Oh, I definitely, I mean, I even showed my mom today and like the picture from last year at OTAs and then the picture from the Titans video that they took. And my mom started off when I showed it to her with like the, Oh, stop it. You know? And then she looked at it and goes, well, it's not very nice to say on the radio. So it's like, I mean, to me, it's obvious. And again, I, the one I thing just, I'm not I, doing, I I'm not see, I don't look at players. it and say, man, he's out of shape. I mean, is he five pounds heavier? Maybe. But I don't, I don't see anything beyond that. I mean, we're but. talking about a position where Floyd used to say Corey Davis needed to lose weight. Right? Like, sure. You what know, those things, it? that five pounds you're talking about, that's important. Well, last year, everybody was on their knees for Traylon Burks because he yeah, had lost he was the in weight. Great shape. So we're yeah, not going to give him shape. credit last year and then sit here this year and be, oh, it doesn't matter. He'll lose okay. that weight. I need to see him to definitively say in shape, out of shape. I can't look at a picture and say, yep, he's out of shape. I, I, I can't. Look, if he put on 30 pounds, if he looked like James Harden beginning of last season, I could say, yeah, he's out of shape. I mean, the guy that looks was... like he, yeah, he was huge, right? I mean, there was no doubt yeah. about that. But um, I don't see that. Like I said, maybe he put on a couple pounds, but I didn't see anything that where I looked at Traylon Burks and went, oh, my gosh, he's just mailed it in. I, just, I, I cannot go there. I need more evidence, all right? You might be right, but I need evidence i need to see him on the field i've decided this is like the opposite of the aaron brewer thing where like last year i was like he's too small and i was like oh no 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 (laughs) and this is you know i guess the opposite so Corey, we've been posing this draft question to everybody on the program this week that joins it which is if both joe alt and malik neighbors are there with the seventh overall pick And there's the elite touchdown score because I know Brian Callahan's like, you know, well, Jamar Chase is different than everybody else, but Mm -hmm. neighbors to me profiles as an elite touchdown score. Like he checks the boxes, the pro days, the combine, like it all matches up. If, if you're there, elite touchdown score versus elite non-touchdown score and alt, who do you take? You know, we, we've talked about this a lot and everybody has, and for good reason, because it is, it's a tough one. It, it is. And, you know, look, 10 years ago, I would have just said Joe Alt. You know, it wouldn't have been a question. But I continue to say Joe Alt because we have seen repeatedly how a horrific offensive line hamstrings absolutely everything. 
And you don't want to get into the quarterback carousel because your quarterback is killed. Then it doesn't matter who your receivers are. All right. I mean, mm-hmm. the, there's a reason the Chicago bears have stunk forever because they can't ever have anybody behind center. Who's any good. And you got to have somebody behind center. Who's good. And he's got to have some kind of protection. The other thing is, don't you feel like it's easier these days to find good wide receivers? I mean, everybody's got two and three now. And, and you oh, can no, man. A the and Titans. Th- I mean. Titans, what quarterbacks are to the Bears, all right? And the, the Titans are the one off. They're the one team that can't find them, okay? There's a lot of teams with a lot of good receivers. And you can get them, like I said, beyond the first round. And so I think your chances of finding another elite quality receiver are better than it is of finding another elite offensive tackle. And if you, that's if you think Joe Alt is elite. If you think Joe Alt is an eight-time pro bowler in 10 years, I, I, I'd have to pull the trigger and just say, we'll, we'll find somebody to throw the football to. And we got two pretty good ones already. Corey, I've got a kind of a fireball hot take question for you, a draft scenario. You know, there's a lot yeah. of smoke that J.J. McCarthy's not only going to go in the top four, that he may go in the top three, that he may go number two is now some mm-hmm. of the chatter. I don't believe it, but that's the chatter. If Drake May or Jaden Daniels falls to the seventh pick, do <sighs> you try to trade that pick or do you take the quarterback and the five years of contractual control – and deal Will Levis, or do you keep Levis and deal that pick of that quarterback? Well, okay, first off, let's start with Levis. You know, we all think he's pretty good, and he's got a lot of good traits to him. But the rest of the league does not think that. Vegas does not think that. That five-and-a-half win total tells you they don't believe very much in him. And just look at Twitter, the rest of the league doesn't believe very much in him and go back to Justin Fields, Justin Fields, they, they got him for a sixth round pick. So how much value is there going to be for Will Levis in the trade market right now? Probably not as much as we think there might be. So I think number one, dealing with him, you're not, you, you I don't think you would get as much of a return as, as you would like. And again, it comes down to, do you think that this guy's a generational quarterback? Do you think he's better than Will Levis? I, I, I give I, people are probably bored of hearing me saying it. There's a lot of teams that passed on Aaron Rodgers because they had a quarterback. There's a lot of teams that passed on Adrian Peterson because they already had a running back. And, and we knew those guys were players coming out of the draft, but teams didn't need them. Well, you always need players who are better than the ones you got. So if one of those guys is there at seven and you say he's better than Will Levis, you absolutely have to pull the trigger and take him. And you know who told me that? The GM. Floyd Reese. That's right. Corey Curtis is with us from News 2. Do you have any interest in a right tackle? You know, there's been some chatter now. I think Matt Miller and both Charles Davis brought up the Titans and kind of tied them to Thalys Fuaga. And you know Charles better than I think most people do. I don't think Charles, you know, when Matt Miller at ESPN says, I'm hearing the Titans, if they don't get alt, they'll trade down for Fashnu or Fuaga. And then Charles Davis says on Sirius XM, if Alt's off the board, then they could go with Fashanu or Fuaga. I'm like, okay, I think somebody's talking from the Titans, and they're doing that on purpose, which makes me think that it's not true. But for this exercise, any thoughts on a right tackle, Latham, Fuaga, Jordan Morgan, Guyton out of uh, Oklahoma, or are we just really focused here, left tackle with Alt, Fashnu, Faltanu, and maybe Amarius Mims? you cannot draft a right tackle at number seven. You, you can't because you still got to pay a left tackle. All right. Mm-hmm. And so you, you, that capital has to fix that left side of the line. You can patchwork the right side together. Heck you could take a t- right tackle in round two if you wanted it. But I, I, you, I, I would view that as a wasted opportunity and a problematic situation in four years when their contract is up and you got to pay them. We, we saw that with Jack Conklin. They didn't want to pay him because he played right tackle. Well, then you shouldn't have picked him ninth overall or wherever they picked him um, mm-hmm. because that's, that's the problem you run into. Again, if, if Alt is not there, 
and you and you do want to draft one of those guys, you cannot do it at seven. You have to trade down. Fireball Hot Take Friday. Corey Curtis is with us. What's your hot take this week? My, you know what? I, I think I told you last week I was all in on Joe Alt, so I got to come up with 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 something better than that. Um, but let's talk about the Nashville Predators, okay? It has been a fabulous run. Um, I fear they are out of gas. You don't think that the you don't think that you know this little you know where they're they're playing games, but they've already got everything, you know taken care of I'm, and then the fact that they'll play monday and probably not play until like saturday or sunday will be able to recharge those batteries yeah you know maybe physically but can they get it back to where they were that's i mean that's I, I you know they were they had it going at an elite level and you felt good about that level going into the postseason and i'm not saying that they can't do it i just i need to see them get it back all right, I need to see him get him. And, there, and I know Coach Burnett has said that he's liked the game that they've brought, and, and I don't completely disagree with him. You know, they've given up some sloppy, you know, easy goals, you know, with some turnovers. Um, but, you know, that, that's just the fear that I have, that there was so much effort that went into 16-0-2. Can they get it back? I, I, I'm, fingers crossed, because if they do, it's going to be fun, you know, win or lose. Um, but I, I need to see that level again um, before I get real excited for the playoffs here. Well, I'll tell you what does excite me, though, is that Soros has been playing like Soros lately, and that means that you can steal some games in the playoffs. Yeah, and that's always the key, right, is, is having a – I mean, like Pekka against Chicago. I was going to say, it is in this franchise. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's done it before, um, or we've seen it before. And, and they don't have to get you through every series, but sometimes they have to get you through one. And for the Preds, you could argue the first one's going to be the toughest one. If you can get through mm-hmm. the first round, because you're going to play what Vancouver, Dallas, or or Colorado, Edmonton. Or, 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 uh, yeah, I mean you're going to play an elite team. Um, and if you get through that one, your second round matchup could be easier. So you know he he's he's got to start fast. That's for sure. Corey Curtis, news too, as always on our program. Corey, great stuff. Appreciate you as always. All right, thanks, man. Talk to you later. Yep, so I have made a lot of people mad. But, I mean, once you just keep seeing the signs over and over again, it's pretty obvious somebody's telling you something without saying it. And I just think a lot of Titan fans don't want to believe it. We'll do that coming up next. Time now to take a look at the leaderboard from Augusta, which is brought to you by Burger Republic. Go try it for a limited time. Their Green Jacket Burger for a true Masters experience as of right now. Bryson DeChambeau is your leader at eight under. He's through 13 for uh, round two. Meanwhile, Homa is number two at six under, and Scotty Scheffler is five under. He's in third. Again, that's your Masters leaderboard. Stillman and Company, 1025, 106 for the game.
when you look at your group of wide receivers after adding Calvin to that group, um, how open are you to still adding to that room? And are there any skill sets or traits in particular that you feel like you might currently be lacking? No, I think you're always open um, to adding to those spots. I mean, we, we have to have someone emerge for us um, at, at the slot position receiver when we're in 11 personnel. That's one that um, we got some, some young players I'm excited to take a look at uh, with obviously Cal Phillips. Uh, Mason Kinsey's been around here a little bit. He's shown his, his meadow. Obviously, uh, Nick Westbrook, Akina, has been involved in some of those spots over his career. So um, trying to find someone to merge in that spot, um, you know, you got guys that you're trying to always build youth and depth as well. And so those things are uh, in constant flux. You're always trying to have another guy ready to roll. Um, you need depth at every position. That's not just just the receivers, but um, you're always open to those guys. And again, guys that are fast, explosive, and physical, uh, you can't have enough of them. Okay, so that was on Wednesday, and he didn't mention Traylon Burks, and everybody said, what's that mean? And since then, people have decided to make excuses and say, well, maybe he was talking about the slot. Maybe, but he wasn't asked about the slot. He was asked about adding depth at receiver. And then he said, you know, hey, yeah, we use it in the slot. We could use this guy, this guy, this guy, and not Burks. And, you know, when somebody keeps telling you something and you ignore it because you want to ignore it, that then becomes your fault. And that's what I think is happening here. Because this isn't the first time that Brian Callahan has said a little something about Traylon Burks, or in this case, didn't say anything. And I thought that was pretty telling. So the Titans official Titans podcast uh, came out this week, which was Brian Callahan and Rand doing a Q&A with Mike Keith for the Nashville Sports Council. And I guess they just decided to repurpose it for everybody on the podcast. And Mike Keith asked, and remember, Traylon Burks is not a rookie, okay? This is his third year. Mike Keith asked, how the addition of Hopkins and Ridley could help Traylon Burks. Here's what Brian Callahan said then. What can those two guys do for Traylon Burks' development potentially? Well, you get to be, you get a chance to see for a young player like him, you get a chance to see what another two other veteran, productive veteran receivers look like, how they work, how they approach their, their craft, how they approach their work day. Uh, how they take care of themselves, how they prepare for a game. Um, and then there's, a, there's an element of playing receiver in the NFL that's confidence-based. And, and these guys have an incredible amount of self-confidence. Um, it's almost delusional the way that they, f- they feel about how well they can do their jobs. And that's how you have to be uh, to go out there every Sunday and, and, and play in front of all these people and, and produce. So to have a young player see that from two veteran players, I think, is uh, is an important part of, of any player's development at, at all positions, truthfully. Uh, but but those two guys, I think, will really give him an example to follow. You do realize DeAndre Hopkins was on the team last year, right? So if it was, well, you know, this is going to be great for Traylon Burks to be able to watch DeAndre Hopkins this year, he could have done that last year. And again, DeAndre Hopkins is a veteran. Calvin Ridley's a veteran. Traylon Burks is a veteran. He's in his third season. To me, I think that's Brian Callahan saying Traylon Burks needs to learn how to be a pro. Traylon Burks needs to follow these guys. He needs to see how they prepare. He needs to see how they take care of themselves. He needs to see. That's one thing to say about a rookie, right? Maybe even a second-year player. But this is a third-year guy. So Brian Callahan, when asked about Burks and what Hopkins and Ridley can do for him, and I think Mike Keith was asking a question like, oh, yeah, that'll open the field, so now the matchups will allow Burks to be able to, and instead he's like, well, he can watch how they take care of themselves. That is telling, folks. Again, he's not a rookie. He played on a team as a rookie with Robert Woods. And we talked about how important is it for Traylon Burks to have a veteran like Robert Woods in that room. It's year three. Brock Purdy was in the same draft class. And is anybody saying, you know what's good for Brock Purdy to watch a veteran operate? No, because Brock Purdy is a veteran now. He's telling you, I want him to see how those guys work because those guys work hard. In fact, 
this isn't the only time that Callahan's brought this up at the Combine. And I don't know who the hell asked this question. Because I have said that, you know, Traylon Burks, in my opinion, has so much God-given ability. So much talent. I, I said, I think he's got more God-given ability than A.J. Brown. People got all crazy about that. That doesn't mean he's better than A.J. Brown. But I think he's got, you know, just natural gifts. Because to be able to play at the size that he plays at, you got to be pretty good. So he was asked at the Combine about comparing Burks to Jamar Chase, even if you could. He was asked about this. Now, I don't know who the hell is asking the question comparing Burks to Jamar freaking Chase. I mean, why not Why not compare him to Jerry? What, what does it remind you of him and Jerry Rice? But, again, different discussion. But when Callahan gets done kissing the feet of Jamar Chase, listen to what he says about Burks. It would be really hard for me to um... – to, to compare Jamar to anybody but Jamar, um, he's 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 sort of his own animal, if you will. He's he's incredibly talented. There's not many receivers like him in football. Um, so to compare anybody to him, I think would be unfair. Um, I do like uh, some of the traits that Traylon has shown on tape. Uh, there's some things that I'm excited to work with, um, and then he's got to do his part when it comes down to the to taking care of yourself and making sure he's ready to roll when we start. Um, but but talented player and, and one that's got. Uh, some development to go. I, I would say Jamar's development is is uh, in a whole different stratosphere. He didn't need a whole lot of it. Uh, but, again, I, I'm excited about what Traylon could bring for us once, once he comes in the building. He needs to start taking care of himself, and he needs to be ready to roll. Again, this is coming from a guy who's never coached, which makes me think that there's probably some people that were here last year that are still with this team that are like, hey, Burks needs to step it up. And I'm sorry, but you guys can keep making excuses for it. You guys can say, well, you know, Burks is naturally a little chubby. I know. So am I. Now, I don't play receiver in the NFL, but that's something that he's got to watch every day if he's going to be able to compete at a high level. And when the coach keeps saying he needs to follow those guys that are pros, he needs to be a pro. He needs to take care of himself. He needs to be ready to go. He needs to. And then on the first, on the third day is asked about receiver depth and doesn't even bring him up. Guys, Brian Callahan is telling you what he thinks of Traylon Burks. He doesn't like him. I'm telling you right now. And my guess is it's all about effort. It's all about, you know, Hey, I, I can, as a coach, puts you in position to be successful. And I like some of the traits you have on the tape, but you have to do your part too. And if you don't do your part, you're not going to be on the field. And I don't have to put you on the field because I didn't trade A.J. Brown for you. And for some reason, I'm the bad guy. Again, I'm the bad guy for pointing out what somebody is trying to tell you and you don't want to hear. I'm the bad guy. But it's obvious I mean, it's obvious that Brian Callahan is trying to push Traylon Burks. And I said this. I go, when Callahan doesn't mention Burks on Wednesday, it is, a one, it is for one of two reasons. One, Callahan wants Burks to think that he doesn't care about him. Like, I so don't care about you that I'm not even going to mention you while I mention Mason Kinsey. So he's using that to motivate Burks. Or two, he doesn't care about Burks, which is way worse. But if you think that there's any other meaning than those two, you're wrong. He's told you that. He's shown you that. He needs to learn how to be a pro. He's been in the league for three years. Stop babying these players. You want to baby a guy who's a rookie? You guys do this all the time. Malik Willis throws the football away in a two-minute drill. Hey, he's a rookie, Jared. It's not fair. Who cares? He's out there on Sunday night football. You weren't happy about that, were you? Stop babying these players. Stop making excuses. The way you guys made excuses for Aaron Brewer and the way you guys make excuses for Clowney. Well, Jared, his pass win rate is really, really good. He sucked. When he was a tight, stop making excuses. I I thought signing Vic Beasley was going to be a good idea for the Titans. I was wrong about that, but I didn't make excuses when the guy went out there and freaking sucked. Stop 
making excuses. Stop babying these players. 615-737-1025. We're to your phones next here on Stillman and Company. Again, live out at the Jack Lowe Brewery, 1025-1063 the game. Let me tell you about Hiller Plumbing, Heating, Cooling, and Electrical. I love Hiller. They take great care of my home. They can do the exact same for you. Smile and save this month with Hiller Plumbing, Heating, Cooling, and Electrical because from now until April 30th, you can take advantage of big savings on home systems. Enjoy up to $1,500 off. Select new HVAC systems, whole home water filtration and descalers, or select new whole home generators. If you've been waiting for the right time to upgrade or replace your systems, now is the time. So just go to happyhiller.com today for details. Again, that's happyhiller.com for details. That's Hiller Plumbing, Heating, Cooling, Electrical, the guys I trust at my home. Hiller, proud supporters of the Preds, the Vols, and Vandy. Call the Happy Face Truck today.
Jared, how can you say that? This guy, his listen, and, and I'm just going through the mentality of a competitor, and I really believe that this guy's competitor. I know he understands what's at hand. They, he automatically went from the from a, a starting receiver to being the third receiver. So as a competitor, I am not going to come into camp out of shape. I am not going to come in camp not prepared. And I think this guy right here, Traylon Burks, knows what's at stake. So I don't think that he's not going to work out and run routes and do the things that he's supposed to do because there's a lot at stake. So I know, <laughs> I know people are looking at that and say, well, his cheeks are big. That could be the angle of the camera, Jared. You can't, you, you can't go by that. I want to jump through this phone and kick you in both your kneecaps. Chris Sanders earlier this week got mad because I just said, look, I've seen pictures on Instagram, and then the Titans put out a video on Instagram, and Burks looks chubby. I'm just going to say it. Like, compared to what he was last offseason, he looks like he's put on some weight. And when Brian Callahan keeps talking about how he needs to take care of himself, I mean, again, the injuries that Burks had, it was a knee injury last year. I don't think there's really anything he could have done to prevent that. And it was a concussion. And he had a concussion against the Eagles. Like, I mean, a guy decapitated him. I didn't, there's nothing he could do about that. That's not what he means by take care of himself. And I don't want to be the bad guy here. I want things to work out for Burks. But I'm not blinded by my desire to root for him. He looks chubby. And he plays a skinny man's position. It's not a personal thing. It's not a, you know, fat shaming thing. It's football. And when the head coach continues to kind of show like, hey, I'm I'm a little concerned, you know, he needs to take care of himself. He needs to learn how to be a pro. He needs to come on now. Just like we made excuses. And remember the excuses we made when he had to bow out of his first practice of rookie minicamp? And it was like, oh, well, it was hot that day. With the asthma thing? Well, the asthma was what they came up with later. But at first, it was it was hot that day in Nashville. He had to put ice packs on him because he was hot. Mm-hmm. Like, this is the NFL. What was the excuse you had, Ian, about Burks earlier this week? Oh, maybe he has his uh, wisdom teeth or some dental work done. <laughs> Amazing. Ryan in Nashville says, and look, I'm not trying, I'm just calling it how it is. And honestly, I hope this, you know, motivates a little bit, right? Like instead of, oh no, it'll be okay. I'm not doing that. This year career, babe, like right now, as of right now, you are a bust. B-U-S-T, bust. And the going rate on a first round bust who catches 14 passes when they hit free agency is not very much, especially when a coach doesn't want to talk about you because he's probably not thinking about you because he doesn't care about you because he doesn't think you can help him. Ryan in Nashville says, I think some of what Callahan is noticing in Burks is that he doesn't have that killer mentality all the time. His mannerisms, the sound of his voice, he comes off as laid back and nonchalant. The killer mentality showed up when he made a big catch on the Packers, but I think Callahan is wanting that mentality from Burks 24-7, not just in random moments during a game. When Callahan says he needs to learn how to be a pro, maybe I could stretch it there. When Callahan says he needs to learn how to take care of himself and be ready to roll, that's not what he's talking about. I mean, one texture said, Burks weighed at 225 at the combine. I bet he's 240 now. No idea how much he weighs. It does remind me of when that, you know, uh, Bruce Feldman talked to a college coach after the draft, and the college coach said that Burks was two biscuits short of being a flexed-out tight end. And I remember, like, I remember telling TD that. TD was, did not like that. But, I mean, Burks posted a picture, or Burks didn't post a picture. There was a picture of Burks that was posted that he put in his Instagram story a couple of weeks ago that I saw, and I looked at it, and I sent it to Caroline, and I was like, is he competing for wide receiver or tackle? And it's like, again, if the coach had come out and said, oh, Traylon's in great shape. He's doing everything he needs. We're really excited to be different. The coach is saying he needs to take care of himself. Don't be mad at me. Why are people, why would people be mad at me? 
LD from McMinnville says, be a man. Go to the locker room and size him up and ask him face-to-face. Are you chubby? Have you put on extra pounds in the offseason? It's pretty simple. The locker room's not open this time of year. And I did ask Aaron Brewer last year. This is like the opposite of Aaron Brewer. I was telling him, he's too skinny. Oh, no, Jared, you don't understand. Right. I did ask Aaron Brewer about his weight. I was like, how much do you weigh now? He's like, oh, I'm like 290. Uh-uh. Joe was like, well, you're going to ask Aaron Brewer about his weight? Yes. Because these things matter. Like, it matters that Aaron Brewer has no tush. It matters. Like, that wins you and loses you football games. Randy says, when you gain weight in the first place, you notice it is your face. Bingo. I'll tell you what. Most people wouldn't say what I'm about to say on the radio, but I'm going to say it anyways. When Floyd died, I started taking an antidepressant called Lexapro. And I am very, very sensitive to any type of anything. So if there's like any side effect, like I'm going to feel it. And ultimately, I just stopped taking this Lexapro because one of the side effects is weight gain. And I mean, I was eating like a freaking fatty. Stop taking the Lexapro. Last year, we did the PhD weight loss. Joe and I both lost a lot of weight doing it. And first place I noticed it when I started taking the Lexapro, my face. First place I started noticing it when I was on PhD weight loss, and it's basically keto, and I was losing the weight, my face. It's always the first place, at least for me. One texture says, isn't Burks another player the Titans drafted that have medical issues coming in? No, he did not. Burks looked solid on paper to draft. Steven says he's noticed Burke's face. I mean, everybody's like, I don't see it. It could be the camera. It could be the, I mean, it could be. Like, I don't understand why Chris Sanders felt the need to defend him so hard. Like, Chris is like the mentality of a competitor. Do you think Burks has the same mentality you had when you played? Mm, I'm not so sure about that. 615-737-1025 is our phone number. If you want to weigh in again, that's 615-737-1025. We are live today out at the Jackalope Brewery, where today at 5.30, they will have the ribbon-cutting unveiling of the Preds Beer Mural right here, 5.30 at the Jackalope Brewing Company, forty-two or 429B Houston Street, 429B Houston Street uh, for that. Coming up next, Big Blue Nation was about to Burned down last night. Woo! We'll get to that next. Snowman and Company, 1025, 1063, the game.
Still been a company, 1025, 1063, the game streaming live on Twitter, Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook Live, live from the Busy Bee Plumbing, Heating, and Air Conditioning Game Nashville Studios. Today we're live at Jackalope Brewing Company right here in the heart of Wedgwood, Houston, because at 5.30 they will be unveiling the Preds Beer Mural. Out here on the wall here, again, appearances by Nash, the Energy Team, the Preds Foundation, and 20% of Preds Beer Draft sales today will be donated to the Preds Foundation. So get excited. Of course, they'll have the game on tonight at 7.30. So last night, Kentucky hired Mark Pope to be their head coach. Many of you people, especially if you're under the age of 40, are wondering who the hell is Mark Pope? Well, he did play at Kentucky in 96 on that great team that Patino had. And he was BYU's coach, and he was okay as BYU's coach. And last night, Big Blue Nation was ready to burn down. And as somebody who went to Kentucky's biggest rival, I'm not going to lie, Ian, I kind of enjoyed it. I'm sure. I enjoyed it last night. Ian, are you familiar with Twitter Spaces? Is that like the, um, I don't know, audio kind of like uh, situation they got there? Yeah, it's kind of like the thing that allows anybody to host a radio show if they want to. Okay. It's like, oh, yeah, here, join my spaces where I, it's basically the new message board. It's and like you just the use extremists. Your phone microphone yes. and kind of go out there. Okay. It's like the extremists of the Kentucky fan base are all like, we got to have some, we got to have a show. We got to talk about this at 1130 at night. 25,000 people were listening to Matt Jones, Twitter space, including me. So was Tom Hart of the SEC network. Jimmy Dykes was on there listening to that. It was great. Kentucky fans were furious. You replaced John Calipari with this? Mark Pope in his career, nine seasons as a head coach, some at Utah Valley or something or another. Got a 63% winning percentage, no conference titles, two NCAA appearances, 0-2 in the NCAA tournament. You replaced John Calipari with this? Now, look, I'll agree. His resume to me does not scream Kentucky. But for all the guys that would have, been quote-unquote good enough, they didn't want the job. You you offered Danny Hurley an ungodly amount of money. He said no. You, You can't force him to take the job. Scott Drew prayed on it. He said no. Billy Donovan's still coaching a team that's going to make the playoffs. And Kentucky with Mitch Barnhart didn't want to hire a coach with baggage. Bruce Pearl, Sean Miller, Chris Beard. So at that point, once you've decided, I'm not going to take the dented car here. I mean, I want somebody that can be Kentucky's coach. You have to go into scouting mode and find the next great coach the same way the Minnesota Vikings are trying to find the next great quarterback. And think about this. In the NFL, we don't do this, do we? Take coordinators who have no experience all the time. Mike Vrabel had one year as a coordinator. The team was terrible, and he got a head coaching job. And before we get on Kentucky, it's fun to get on Kentucky because their fans are so obnoxious, but before we get on Kentucky, I think Kentucky's one of the three best jobs in college basketball. Kansas, I guess, will include, so one of the four best jobs. Duke just changed the coach. Guess what? No head coaching experience prior to getting the job. North Carolina just changed the coach. No head coaching experience prior to the job. Both guys were alums. Mark Pope is an alum, but he's got experience as a head coach. And to me, all this proves is this is not 20 years ago. 20 years ago, North Carolina could hire Kansas's coach away after they made a national title game. Kentucky can hire Memphis's coach after they make a national title game. But this isn't 20 years ago, and everybody has money now. Illinois has money. Vanderbilt has money. 20 years ago, if Vandy had a basketball coach who just freaking crushed it, you could make the argument that, hey, 
Kansas or somebody else could come along and offer more money. But now, if Mark Byington is good, then he's going to be Vandy's coach. So now you have to find, there. you got two choices here. You have to find the next great outside the top power five schools coach like Dusty May went to the final four at FAU, so now he's Michigan's coach. Or you have to hire a veteran coach who's like a used car. And as is the case with every used car, there's a reason why somebody sold it back. There's a reason Cal was available for Arkansas. There's a reason Rick Patino would have been available for the job. Mistresses, abortions, hookers, FBI wiretaps. That's why Rick Pitino is available. Do you want that? Mark Pope has a fine resume. It's not a good resume. It's a fine resume. But I made the point today when I was on Robbie and Rex Road, and I needed Joe to back this up because Joe was there. Mark Pope's resume at BYU isn't that much different than Nick Saban's resume prior to LSU at Michigan State. And I'd argue his resume is a lot better than Kim Caldwell who just inherited Pat Summit's Lady Balls. So this isn't a terrible hire, at least not yet. On paper, these are the kind of guys that you have to hire. Duke did not go get Jay Wright to be their coach. Carolina did not go get a superstar Phil Jackson-level coach. No, they took guys that were alums of the school that were on the staff that didn't have any experience. So Kentucky fans feel entitled to get Bill, uh, Billy Donovan or Jay Wright or Brad Stevens. Matt Jones did a show after Kentucky got beat by Oakland. And they were like, well, who's it going to be, Matt Jones? And he was like, well, I think they first, well, I think what they got to do is I think they need to ask Brad Stevens first and then Jay Wright. I'm like, you're not getting Jay Wright. Jay Wright's retired. They retired. So this is what you end up with, is Mark Pope. And is Mark Pope going to be good? I don't know. You can't tell from these resumes anyways, right? What was the difference between Kirby Smart's resume and Jeremy Pruitt's resume? If anything, Jeremy Pruitt had a better resume because Jeremy Pruitt won a national title away from Nick Saban. Kirby Smart never did. So Kentucky fans need to chill out. I have no idea if Mark Pope's a good coach or not, but he's got experience, and it's not bad experience. So this is par for the course here. It's just hard because they crapped on Louisville when Louisville went the same route and maybe hired a better coach. I think we probably did hire, resume-wise, a better coach. That being said, I am thoroughly enjoying the big blue meltdown of reality, the look in the mirror and saying, we thought we were the greatest basketball program of all time. We thought we were God's gift to basketball. Rupp, Joby Hall, Rick Patino, Denny, or uh, Rick Patino, Tubby Smith, John Calipari. We thought we were God's gift. We thought we were going to get Danny Hurley, Scott Drew, national title winning coaches, Jay Wright, Brad Stevens, Billy Donovan, Mike Krzyzewski, John Wooden, and we got Mark Pope. I loved it. I loved every second of it. But the reality is there's a chance that Mark Pope might actually be a good coach. 615-737-1025, your reaction to that news. I can't tell you whether that is going to be any good or not. I'll say this. He did a decent job at BYU, and supposedly you can't recruit players that will have premarital sex or drink. So I think that the recruiting pool will be a little bit more open. I feel bad, though, for Mark Pope. Got his dream job, right? Former Kentucky captain of the 96 championship team. He got his dream job. But there's one reason that I do feel bad for him. I mean, legitimately bad for him. It's not his fault. And I almost feel like he's getting used. And we'll get to that next. Stillman and Company right here, live again from the Jackalope Brewing Company, 1025, 106 through the game. Tune in to 94.9 The Fan today as Vandy Baseball takes on A&M. 
Pre-game is at 545. First pitch at 6. Vandy Baseball brought to you by Smoky Mountain Tops, your countertop experts. Visit SmokyMountainTops.com. What about some things you think will get better with Mark Pope as the coach? Well, I, I, I don't. I think as, as we 
you know, look forward. And that's why I want to be really focused on that. Um, and I, I think that's where you're headed to, Matt. I, I, I really appreciate Mark's desire to bring the Big Blue Nation and all of us together as we galvanize to go back and be who we want to be. There you go. That was Mitch Barnhart on Kentucky Sports Radio, and he's talking about how, you know, this coach, Mark Pope, he's going to bring us together. And I think that line there at the end was the best. Bring us back to who we want to be. Not who we were under John Calipari. And so I have no idea if Mark Pope will work out. I couldn't tell you one way or another. And anybody who could either knows Mark Pope or is lying to you. So I have no idea if it's going to work. But what I find hysterical about the Mark Pope situation is he's really in the middle of the finalized divorce between Mitch Barnhart and John Calipari. It was the world's worst kept secret that they did not like each other, especially after in 2022, Cal was mad that he wasn't going to get a new practice facility. And he made a comment to reporters that Kentucky was a basketball school and Mark Stoops got all mad about it. And so Mitch Barnhart called the press conference and this was kind of the moment that everybody knew what people had known for a long time behind the scenes that Mitch and Cal didn't get along. This is what Mitch Barnhart said in August of 2022. I have two coaches that have been with me, one 13 years and one 10 years. I can't speak to that. That's their call. But I will tell you, I'll be there with them. I'll walk with them, both of them. I've walked with them all this way. I hired them both. I gave them the opportunities to coach here, their families to come here to win championships here, to go to bowl games here. I've walked with both of them, through both good and bad, and they both know it. They don't have, they don't have to fear the administration. The administration has been right here the whole time, and we got a president that's been right here the whole time. It ain't changing. And they've been provided every opportunity to do the very things that they want to do to be successful. That isn't changing, as long as I'm in the chair. We will have that support. And if that's not good enough, you know, coaches change a lot in today's world. They do. I know Bitch Barnhart, and I'm going to tell you this right now. He is not a confrontational person. He is a very calm, fluid thinker. You know, he's really, I mean, again, like, I'll tell you this right now. I was talking yesterday with the Louisville Athletic Director, and he obviously knows Mitch Barnhart pretty well, and they're big rivals. And he and I were talking about, like, Mitch is a good man. And so it was, I mean, that is a nuclear warhead coming out from Mitch Barnhart in 2022. And Cal came out and walked it back a little bit. But the damage was done. And the reality is Mitch Barnhart wanted his basketball program back. And he was tired of ceding to John Calipari's every want, John Calipari's every need. And Mitch Barnhart actually had Cal's back when the fans wanted to run him out after they lost to Oakland and he did a sit down interview about, Oh, we're going to fix this. We're going to, but that was all bull crap. The two did not see eye to eye. And now that their divorce is finalized, they are now still, even though it's over taking shots at one another. This was Calipari in his opening press conference at Arkansas. I said, tell me about Hunter. Well, he almost jumped through the phone. And I said, T what are you talking about? I talked to his assistant who used to work for me, Bilal, and he said, when you need things done, then he goes and do does it. He's, he's, what can I do to help you? And then we're going to get it done. I mean, what he did at Houston, the building, the practice facility, all this stuff, and what Kelvin needed so he could coach basketball. Um, that got me to where I had to listen. Because I'm going to say it again, basketball coaches win games. Administrations win championships. And you know why? Because they want to. And it's important to them. I mean, Cal, he can't hold back. He can't. So here's Cal Perry. This athletic director will do whatever I need because of this guy's committed unlike the last guy. And you can think that, oh, that had nothing to do with it, but that's like Joe Rexrode thinking that Mike Vrabel's comments about how 
I know it's not like this everywhere. I've been places. Trust me, Patriot fans. Didn't mean he was signing with the Titans. Come on now. Meanwhile, Barnhart's on the other side of it, which was basically that, you know, the way that this kind of worked at Kentucky was Cal did things his way. His coaching staff, his support staff, you know, his he kind of separated himself from the university. Didn't talk much to the AD, pushed the boosters out. It was Cal's boosters versus the Kentucky boosters. And so the Kentucky boosters are like, fine, we'll go to football. And then when NIL becomes a thing, Cal's like, where's my NIL money? It's like, well, you pissed all the boosters off. And this is what Barnhart said uh, today on Kentucky Sports Radio. And you tell me if he's talking about what he expects from his new coach that maybe his last lover didn't necessarily do. It's about the name on the front of the jersey, right? Oh. And and there's yeah. something about that brand. So if you go back and you look at, and if you look at just in the, the social impressions from Monday at 3 o'clock until Tuesday at 3 o'clock, the University of Connecticut won the national championship, obviously, and they had 17 million impressions in that 24-hour period of time. Kentucky basketball coming off something that everyone would agree is not where we want to be. In that same 24-hour period of time, we had 37 million impressions. Over double. So my, my point is the brand is real, and it is really, really important, and we've got to effectively use it, and we use it. We, we combine some things in recruiting with with the tenacity in recruiting, a staff in recruiting, the brand that we have, and then the NIL space, and we've got some people that have already stepped up over the last 24 hours. We've got several donors that have stepped up to put over $4 million in our, in our, in our NIL portfolio for coach to work with. He's telling you right there, it's about the front of the jersey. And our brand is so strong that we'll be able to recruit. It ain't about that carnival barker that we had that was bringing in all those recruits. We're Kentucky. Screw him. We don't need him. We can get the recruits. And we got $4 million bucks in NIL because we got that a-hole out of here that it pissed off all the boosters. I love every single part of this drama. Kentucky, Arkansas will be must-watch. And I got to tell you, I'm rooting for them both to lose. But... As somebody who, like, if it's not a game I care about, I'm not watching basketball. This is, I mean, this could be some juice now. And it's going to be some juice to see whether or not this guy can coach. Because if this guy can't coach, it comes back on Barnhart for, how dare you cut off Calipari? And if Calipari goes to Arkansas, and he's Bobby Knight at Texas Tech, everybody say, Psst. Cal had all those players, won one championship. Bum. I can't wait. Benny in West Tennessee says, Kentucky is finding out what Tennessee football found out after Lane Kiffin. It's not the job it once was. It's not that it's not the job. It is still the job. The problem is, is that everybody else has money and everybody plays on TV. And in the case of Kentucky, those fans are crazy. So you can't just say, okay, Scott Drew, leave your life where you've won a national title, where they'll pay you whatever you want, and you don't get bothered. Go do that to go to Lexington. I mean, he's going to have some reservations about that. One texter says, Kim Caldwell's record is 217 and 31, Jared. One year as a head coach in the Power Five. I mean, excuse me, in, the, in Division One, No experience in the Power Five. I don't give a rat's ass what your Division Two record was if I think you're a top coach for a top job. Kalen DeBoer was a great NAIA head coach in football. And guess what? That got him the Fresno State job. I didn't get him the Alabama job. He was great at Fresno State. He was great at Washington. Then you get the Alabama job. You don't do one year at Marshall and get the UT job if, again, we're talking about great programs. But, again, now everybody has money, so everybody is going to be able to pay their coach. Everybody gets on TV, so everybody's going to be able to recruit. Texter says, I was so mad last night, Jared, but now I have made my first ever NIL donation. Mark Pope will put the program first. Ian, I love this. I love, love when an, unpop- an unpopular decision is made 
And then five minutes later, once everybody calms down, Mm -hmm. they're always like, I love it for my team. My team did the right thing. Yeah, seeing some of that this morning. A lot of, oh, last night, kind of not happy. This morning, sleep on it. You wake up. You maybe realize, hey, he went to Kentucky. He was on the 96 championship team. Who else was going to coach us? You know. So I want to do some blind resumes on Mark Pope. You know, I got his resume in front of me. Nine seasons as a head coach, one of the Power Five. He's got a winning percentage of 634, no conference titles, two NCAA appearances, 0-2 in the NCAA tournament. Were there better coaches on the market than him? We'll do that next here. And your phones, of course, Stillman and Company, live from the Jackalope Brewing Company. Again, the Preds mural tonight will be unveiled here at 530. We're excited about that. Fireball whiskey. There is no better way to celebrate the end of what was a surprisingly great season or to get excited for the playoffs. There's no better way to do that than to get excited with ice-cold Fireball Cinnamon Whiskey. I love Fireball Whiskey. It goes down so smooth and it tastes so great. So if you're out with your buddies this weekend celebrating whatever it may be, a new coach, an old coach, whatever, then you need to do so with Fireball Whiskey. Ignite the night. Please do it responsibly and be 21 years or older to enjoy. That's Fireball Cinnamon Whiskey. I want to say one last thing. Okay, so I got online last night when this got announced. A lot of skepticism, a lot of frustration, a lot of worry, to be honest with you. Seems much better this morning, but that's still out there. 
part of as an AD, you want everybody to rally the troops. I'm going to get you to put on your Colonel, uh, you know, Mitch Barnhart hat. Rally the troops. Why is Mark Pope going to be successful at Kentucky? I don't know that you can ever describe what it feels like um, to put the C on a shirt and captain a group of guys to a championship. We're going to roll out at Rupp Arena and we're going to have a spotlight on, on the banners that represent this place. There's very few people that can stand on a podium and say they were part of that and they captained the team and now they're ready to lead the ship. This is our time to you know, not bicker. We've been bickering a while about what we should do, not do. It's time to say this is our guy. He's one of ours. And it is time to roll in, get behind this guy, and let's go win something together. And let's make sure that we have um, the heartbeat of what's on the front of that jersey the right way. Boy, I tell you, Mitch Barnhart hates Cal. Did you hear the key word in that, Ian, that he absolutely, like, made sure that he put a little emphasis on right there? What, what was that? Together. We're going to do this together, i.e. not on Calipari Island. So... I wanted to do this, right? I wanted to take a look at these resumes and decide, like, is Mark Pope really a bad hire for UK? Is this resume really that bad? So Mark Pope's resume, he's got nine seasons. Ian, I hope you're listening to this because I'm going to put you on the spot for these. Okay, I'll pay attention. Nine seasons as a head coach, one of the Power Five. He's got a record of 187 and 108, so that's 63%. So his winning percentage is 63%. Zero conference titles, two NCAA appearances, 0-2 in the NCAA tournament. Now, you can argue that it would have been three but COVID, and so if you want to give him three, give him three. I don't care. That's the first one. That's Mark Pope. 63%, no conference titles, two NCAAs, 0-2 in the NCAA. Coach A, 14 seasons as a head coach but five in the Power Five. He's got a record of 258 and 193. That's only 57%. No conference titles, one NCAA appearance, one and one in the NCAA tournament. So that means this coach has won an NCAA tournament game. Ian, would you rather have Mark Pope or Coach A? Uh, A doesn't do much for me. Okay. A is Kyle Smith who is Stanford's new head coach that was hired from Washington State. Would you rather have Mark Pope, again, 63% winning percentage, no conference titles, two NCAA appearances, 0-2 in the NCAA tournament, or Coach B, 12 seasons as a head coach, but zero in the Power Five, a 68% winning percentage at 261 and 122, six conference titles, five NCAA appearances, 0-4 in the NCAA tournament, 2020 was canceled, but his team won their conference title, thus that counts as an NCAA appearance. 0-4 in the NCAA tournament. Would you rather have Coach B or Mark Pope? Yeah, nothing really crazy on B either. Even though he's got six conference titles? Yeah, that doesn't do it for me. No power five? But you'd rather have one, again, You'd rather have 63% with Mark Pope than 68% outside of the Power Five. I think so, yeah. Okay, that's Pat Kelsey, who is Louisville's coach. Coach C, six seasons as a head coach, none in the Power Five, one conference title, 64%, no, excuse me, 65% winning percentage, which is a little bit higher than Pope's at 63, two NCAA tournament appearances, but a record of four and two in the NCAA tournament. Would you rather have Coach C or Mark Pope? Sounds a little bit better. So who would you take? Mm. I'll still lean Pope. Okay. Coach C is Dusty May. The FAU coach took him to the Final Four last year and is now the head coach at Michigan. Coach D. 
12 seasons as a head coach, none of the power five, a record of 220 and 139, a win percentage of 62%, two conference titles, one NCAA appearance, and he's one and one in the NCAA tournament. Mm, I'll still go Pope. Okay, that's Mark Byington, Vanderbilt's new head coach. Coach E, eight seasons as a head coach, two in the Power Five, 72 win percentage, four conference championships, three NCAA appearances, and he's one in three in the NCAA tournament. That one sounds might be the best resume so far, maybe. That is Chris Jans, the head coach at Mississippi State, who nobody wanted to hire, Mm -hmm. who was literally down to take any job. He wanted Arkansas, didn't get it. He wanted Louisville, didn't get it. He was going to take any job. Nobody wanted to hire Chris Jans. So you're telling me you think Mark Pope is a better hire than Kyle Smith, Pat Kelsey, Dusty May, and Mark Byington, but that Chris Jans might have been a little bit better. Based on those numbers, maybe. I just can't get over to me. At some point, conference titles matter. So when Jans has four conference championships, that means something to me. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, I can't believe that you would take Pope over Dusty May. He's got four wins in the NCAA tournament. Yeah, that one, you know, might be a bad call. But If I told you without the blind resume, I said Pope or Dusty May, you wouldn't have thought about it, would you? Probably not. So... Again, that's the blind resume. To me, I think Pope has a... This is just me personally. I think he's got a better resume, or I could argue better resume than Kyle Smith, the Stanford coach. Probably a better resume than Mark Byington because Byington's two conference titles were at James Madison, and but he does have an NCAA tournament, went over a very good Wisconsin team this year. Mm -hmm. But I would take Pat Kelsey, Dusty May, and Chris Jan's resume over Mark Pope. And I'm not even a Chris Jan's fan. But I would take those resumes over Mark Pope. So, you know, on paper, it's a so-so hire. But, again, so was Nick Saban to LSU, and we know how that turned out. Phone lines driven by WilsonCountyHunter.com. Josh from Jackson says, why they didn't go all in on Bruce Pearl is mind-blowing. He may have baggage, but it fits their persona. So here's what happened. Mitch Barnhart didn't want anybody with baggage, which means Bruce Pearl, you're out. Chris Beard, you're out. Sean Miller, you're out. Rick Patino, you're out. And so once you make that decision, you basically have to stick to your principles. And I was talking two weekends ago when Tennessee played Creighton. It's a crazy story. I was walking, you know, I knew I was getting a puppy. So I was walking around my neighborhood just trying to figure out like what are the good spots to walk the puppy. And as I was walking back, I ran into Cal Baxter, the uh the old photog, you know, video camera guy over at News 2. Great guy, great member of that sports department. I ran into Cal Baxter. And he was like, oh, we're going to the bar down the street. You want to come watch games? So, okay. So I was there. I saw people that I knew from college because a Louisville area high school was playing a Nashville area high school in lacrosse. And they were all at the neighborhood bar that I was at. It was like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm seeing you people for the, and because I used to be on the radio there, everybody knows, you know, oh, what do you think of the new basketball coach, Jared? And I said, Here's what I'm going to tell you. I don't know. You know, I don't know if you can win in college athletics without cheating. And a lot of you will say, well, now you can pay the players so it doesn't matter. But I mean like cheating and being sleazy and backstabbing and, you know, people with bad character. I don't know if you can win in college sports that way or if you have to have Bobby Petrino's on your coaching staff in order to win games. I have no idea. But we're going to find out because the Louisville athletic director, Josh Hurd, he's not going to do business that way. And I I don't know, like maybe you need some guys that, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, play in the gray area. But they're not going to do that. And Mitch Barnhart decided in this hire, he's not going to do that. And so once you decide I'm not doing that, Bruce Pearl's off the table. Chris Beard's off the table. 
I mean, Ole Miss's coaches are Lane Kiffin and Chris Beard. They're telling you, we don't give a rat's ass. Just win, baby. And for some people, they don't like that. And I get it. You know, I mean, I don't like, you know, I don't like people that have serious baggage that make me question whether or not they're in it for all the right reasons. That would bother me. And so I see that. 615-737-1025 is our phone number. If you want to weigh in, 615-737-1025 here on our program. Let's talk about the Tennessee Men's Clinic right now. I got to tell you about the Tennessee Men's Clinic. Fellas, you've put this off for way too long, and now it's time to get it done and move forward with your sex life. And the Tennessee Men's Clinic is the leader in bedroom confidence. The reality is pills often quit working, and guys will start making excuses for why they're not coming to bed. Did you know? that studies show that men will be more irritable and more argumentative before bed just to avoid failing at intimacy. And yes, I know many of you hate going to the doctor, but the Tennessee Men's Clinic was created in 2014 to take care of guys just like you. For a decade, the urologists and providers of uh, at the Tennessee Men's Clinic have helped guys with ED and weight loss, and they now even offer aesthetic enhancements and cosmetic procedures. Their ED and weight loss treatments truly change lives, and with no surgery, they are seeing success rates as high as 90%. They specialize in seeing guys who think they're out of luck regain hope that they can be successful in the bedroom and beyond, and they even offer same-day or next-day appointments. So call 615-208-9090. Again, that's 615-208-9090, or go online to TennesseeMensClinic.com to book an appointment today. That's TennesseeMensClinic.com.
But here's another scenario. What if the Los Angeles Chargers stick? They may very well want a Joe All. Yeah. Okay, they already have Rashawn Slater on the left side. You put Joe Alt on the right side. That's another way to help your quarterback. And by the way, you got a new head coach in Jim Harbaugh who likes big physical offensive linemen yes. and a new GM, Joe Hortiz, who came from where? Oh, that's right, Baltimore. Did they invest in, in linemen? Yes. So you have a, a GM and a head coach that thinks similarly about how to construct a football team, one would think, from the outside. So it's not out of the realm that the Chargers might be the team that you may have to get in front of to pick, a, to pick Joe Alden if indeed that is your guy. Okay, that was Charles Davis on Sirius XM NFL Radio. And I know I guaranteed earlier in the week that Jim Harbaugh would not take Joe Alt. The Chargers have a left tackle, Sean Slater. They have a right tackle in Trey Pipkins. Now, Trey Pipkins is not that good, but he is still a legitimate starting right tackle. It ain't Jalen Duncan that the Chargers have out there at right tackle. And yet, everybody that, in theory, would know is saying, oh, man, you got to watch out for Jim Harbaugh. You got to watch out for Harbaugh. Trevor Maddich on our show Tuesday. I asked him, I said, Trevor, you know the college game. You know how Harbaugh operates. Harbaugh doesn't have a receiver. He doesn't have Keenan Allen anymore. He doesn't have Mike Williams. Quentin Johnston might be a bust. He's got a franchise quarterback in Justin Herbert. He's already got a left tackle who's a pro bowler. He's got a right tackle. Is there any chance off of what you know, Trevor, that Jim Harbaugh could go offensive line? Given the fact they don't have a receiver, here's what Trevor said. It wouldn't surprise me at all for Harbaugh to go with offensive line. Everything you said about Harbaugh playing against uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. when Harbaugh was at Michigan, Harrison Jr. was at Ohio State for all those years. Uh, all of that makes sense. It makes perfect sense. The Chargers set up their offseason to need to draft a, a playmaking receiver with that fifth pick. And so it makes perfect sense to do that. But Harbaugh built Michigan from the inside out. He built Michigan like an SEC team. And the reason the SEC has been the dominant league for most years in the last 20 has been, as a league, they've got more big guys that can run in depth than anybody else in college football except for the top of the Big Ten. And Michigan took the top of the Big Ten and made it better than the SEC last year as he won the national championship on both sides of the line. That's why, from a personality standpoint, it wouldn't surprise me at all. So here's the problem, though. They don't have a wide receiver. See, there are two things about this draft that I just have a hard time believing. The first thing I have a hard time believing is that Harbaugh is going to pass on Malik Neighbors or Marvin Harrison Jr. with his star $52 million a year quarterback. A Harbaugh is not some ground and pound coach from the 80s. He played quarterback. Most of the guys who play quarterback want to air the ball out. Right? Like Josh Heupel played quarterback. Josh Heupel wants to air the ball out. So I have a hard time with that. Like the idea that Harbaugh is going to take that job, probably take it in large part because of Justin Herbert. They've already got a left tackle. He's got a shot at Marvin Harrison Jr. or Malik Neighbors, and he ends up saying, nah, screw it. Give me a lineman. I have a hard time with that. That's the first thing. The second thing I don't believe, is I don't believe that, that, and again, this goes back to all that J.J. McCarthy hype. I do not believe that J.J. McCarthy is so super good that Harbaugh held him back because he wants to be a ground and pound coach. I can't think of a team where a coach is like, I got a great quarterback and I'm not going to use him. The guys that you don't use, the guys you hide, they're the game manager types, right? Like Alabama and Georgia have won titles the way that Trevor's talking about. With Stetson Bennett and A.J. McCarron, when Alabama had Bryce Young, they didn't play give Derrick Henry the ball 85 times a game. They did when Jake Coker and Blake Sims were their quarterbacks. But I also don't want to be the guy, because I get on a lot of you for doing this, 
which is you hear something that you don't want to hear or that you don't want to believe. So you just put your hands over your ears and go, la, 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 la. I don't believe that Traylon Burks has these puffy cheeks, like whatever it may be, because you just don't want to believe it. And so I'm not going to do that. I guarantee Harbaugh is not taking Joe Walt with the fifth pick. And yet there's Charles Davis, a guy who knows ball. And he's saying, what about Harbaugh? There's Trevor, a guy that knows ball. And not only knows ball, but knows the college game as well as anybody. And that's where Harbaugh is coming from. And he thinks that Harbaugh may use that pick in order to get a tackle in Joe Walt. Even with Marvin Harrison there. Or Malik Nate. But again, instead of trying to predict what Harbaugh would want to do, I think about it like this. Is Harbaugh stupid? Ian, do you think Jim Harbaugh is stupid? I do not, know. Me neither. He's got Justin Herbert. Wouldn't that be stupid to pass on Malik Neighbors or Marvin Harrison Jr.? I think it would be. And I just don't think Harbaugh's going to do something stupid. So I know that might be his MO. But I stand by my guarantee they ain't taking Joe Wall. No matter how many guys try to tell me they will, I just, just don't think he'll do it. 615-737-1025. Chad Withrow from OutKick joins us next. His reaction, this I'm actually fascinated by. You know, I'm a Louisville fan. Kentucky's our biggest rival. I, you know, the Mark Pope thing, I don't think is the end of the world for them. How does Chad, biggest Tennessee guy I know, how does he feel about it? We'll do that next. Stillman and Company, 1025, 106 for the game.
Dominic Company, 1025-1063. The game streaming live on Twitter, Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook Live, live from the Busy Beat Plumbing, Heating, Air Conditioning Game Nashville Studios. Today we are at Jackalope Brewery, where we are celebrating in 30 minutes the ribbon cutting unveiling of the Preds Beer Mural right here at Jackalope Brewing Company. That's 429 B Houston Street. Nash will be here. The energy team will be here. The Preds Foundation will be here. 20% of Preds Beer Draft sales today will be donated right to the Preds Foundation. And, of course, they got the game tonight. You can watch right here at 730. It is a Fireball Hot Take Friday, which means Chad Withrow joins us now from OutKick. So, Chad, yesterday I enjoyed watching BBN blow up at the idea that Kentucky was hiring Mark Pope as their head coach. That being said, I think there's a chance Mark Pope could be good, but I enjoy the fact that Kentucky thought they were getting Billy Donovan or Jay Wright or Brad Stevens or Phil Jackson, and they ended up with Mark Pope. Your reaction? Uh, my, my reaction was just total laughter, probably like you. Uh, it was glorious to watch the reaction of the Kentucky fan base when they got Mark Pope. It's also funny to see this natural life cycle of a fan base after a hire is made, and especially when it's an unpopular one. Like, the hire's made, and then everyone's upset. No one likes it. Oh, we should have done better. Should have waited two weeks for Billy Donovan. Should have offered Danny Hurley more money, even though he was never going to take that job. Uh, you know, should have talked to God before Scott Drew did, to c- convince God to convince Scott Drew to stay in Waco. But then the moment that – you get your guy, you're upset about it, and by about noon the next day, and I've seen the full evolution of this on Matt Jones' timeline, and even yep. with Matt Jones, it changes from I am shocked, I can't believe this, I don't know how it goes past Bruce Pearl, to suddenly, oh, he's uniting the fan base, he's uniting the boosters, $4 million a year from some NIL person at Kentucky. He's really going to bring everyone together. He's a Rhodes Scholar. He went to Columbia Medical School. He's a smart guy. His offense is great. He's going to bring in his guys from BYU. How quickly it all turns. But here's what I know about Mark Povey. A lot of guys can succeed at Kentucky. And I think he might be able to to succeed at Kentucky. I'm not saying he can't. But there's about 12 guys in college basketball I would have hired before getting to Mark Povey. And one of them is right there in the conference in Bruce Pearl, which I still do not understand why they would not go after Bruce Pearl. I think he's perfect for that Kentucky job. So I I thought when this happened, I knew they weren't going to get, you know, a Jay Wright or a Brad Stevens. I thought they were going to get like a Nate Oates. And the fact that they, I thought they should have hired Bruce Pearl too. But I figured, okay, they'll probably end up hiring Nate Oates. The fact that they couldn't get those guys, is that a sign in your opinion that Kentucky's job is not as good as Kentucky thought it was or that in college basketball, that in order to go get a coach, you have to get them outside of the Power Five because every Power Five school has money. And so the second Kentucky or Duke or Kansas or whoever calls, that coach is just going to get a raise at that job. Yeah, I'm, I'm going with B of your options. You can create your own little fiefdom at whatever program you're at. Scott Drew has created Kentucky in Waco, Texas. He has yeah. his own little Kentucky in Waco. They have a top-10 recruiting class. They've got possibly a one-and-done, number-one overall pick in the NBA draft coming in as a freshman. They've won a national title. So everywhere you look, you can build your own thing anywhere. Not anywhere, but if you're in a job that is in a power conference that has resources, if you're a really good coach, you can create your own happiness wherever you are and not have to worry about Kentucky. Whereas, you know, 20, 25 years ago, If Kentucky offered the Alabama basketball coach, they would have walked to Lexington to take the job. They they wouldn't have stayed. But Nate Oates, you know, I hear from people in Alabama, oh, he likes a little bit warmer weather. He loves it in Tuscaloosa. He likes the freedom he has there. They've already been to a Final Four. They won the SEC. They got the number one overall seed in in an NCAA tournament. He believes he's going to win a national title there, and I don't blame him for believing that based on what he's already accomplished in Alabama. So, I think that was probably a long shot. But, um, yeah, I mean, Kentucky's still a great job. But if you go after any of these coaches that have already built something and done well at a place they like, there's not as big of an incentive to leave where you are because of NIL. And, and this is where it sort of becomes the great equalizer for a lot of programs that have deep pockets. 
did you think that John Calipari made the right decision going to Arkansas? And do you fear Calipari at Arkansas? You know, I really admire John Calipari for, for this. In today's world and in sports, it's all about the money. That's all anyone ever wants to talk about is the money. Well, you would do that for the money, too, or you're trying to get just top dollar wherever you go. Calipari had a chance to stay at Kentucky with that lifetime contract, be mediocre a year from now, get fired, get a massive buyout, and go to the beach somewhere and go hang out with his grandkids or go do whatever he wanted to do. And instead, the guy said, you know what? I'm not wanted here. I still have a lot of value, and this place wants me, and I want to coach ball, and I want to have a team. So I'm going to go. I'm going to take less money. I'm going to let you off the hook for this stupid lifetime contract that you signed with me, and I'm going to let you go in a different direction. I respect that. I respect that because I don't know a lot of people who would have done that, quite frankly. So will it work at Arkansas? I think he's going to get great players. I think it's going to work up to Arkansas's standards. Uh, I don't fear him at Arkansas because I, I don't think he's a great X's and O's coach, but I do believe he's going to get better players and he's going to do well there. But I, overall, I just admire the move by him to not just take the highest dollar and to say, I'm going to go somewhere that wants me. Well, he actually was crazy about it. Chad with us with us from Outkick. He was due $33 million left on that lifetime contract and he got $40 million from Arkansas and I think there are some bonuses in there, you know, some rollovers in there that could make it as much as $60 million or something. And I don't think those are hard to reach incentives like winning the national championship. I think it's like if they make the tournament, his contract rolls over another year and add more money to it. Cal actually made a good financial decision to go to Arkansas, which is crazy to me. Well, he, he could have also made $33 million to do nothing. And if they fired him, he could have gone and doubled down somewhere, I believe. No, nah, it had offsets. Oh, there would have been offsets? Well, he could have gone yeah. and made, made you know very little from his other place to save the money, a la Butch Jones, when he took that sure. GA position at Alabama to cost Tennessee all the money in the buyout. So e- either way, look, I, th- I think it would have been very easy to stay comfortable and stay at Kentucky, but he acknowledged the fact that they don't want me. They need a new voice. Uh, he doesn't like Mitch Barnhart. Mitch Barnhart doesn't like him, clearly. And he moved on, and I kind of respect that move by him. As a Tennessee fan, which game are you more excited for in 2025, Kentucky or Arkansas? Oh, it's always Kentucky. I mean, I've got no – I got no beef with with John Calipari. Hell, Rick Barnes had a winning record against John Calipari uh, when he was in Tennessee. So it's not like they've they've been beating Tennessee badly with him there. So I don't really hate the guy or anything. Uh, I have no care whatsoever for Arkansas – Tennessee, Kentucky is a thing. You know, Tennessee uh, has beaten Kentucky more than any other team in college basketball. Uh, Kentucky's beaten Tennessee a lot more than Tennessee's beaten them, also. But that that is a big time rivalry. So I'm way more excited about Mark Pope versus Rick Barnes than I am Rick Barnes versus John Calipari at Arkansas. Do you th- do you when a, when a coach like this gets hired? And again, we can talk about the resumes all we want, like. You know, I, I think that my coach, Pat Kelsey, I think he's got a better resume than Mark Pope. I don't think it matters. You know, either one guy is good enough to coach at this level and the other guy's not, or they're both good enough or whatever. You know, Josh Heupel's resume was like, what? But obviously he's been a good coach. But where we sit right now, do you think that Mark Pope will work at Kentucky? Uh, yes. I do. Deep down, as funny as it is that Kentucky fans are freaking out and how much I'm relishing in their misery right now, uh, I I do have to tell them that I think he's going to do okay. Uh, I really do. Um, And look, I I think that he's 51 years old. You know, he's he's no spring chicken. He's been around the block. He did very well in his first year in the Big 12 this year at BYU. He's going to have way more resources. It's a way better program than BYU. He knows it well. He's a smart guy. I think he'll do fine. Now, what is fine for the Kentucky fan? That's probably not good enough, right? I mean, it's it's probably national championship or Final Four, you know, within five years. Uh, like, I would say Final it's been two years for three. John. I would say it's been two years for John Shire, and I think he's doing fine at Duke, right? Like, through two years where they got to an Elite Eight and they made the second round of the tournament. But, like, at some point, John Shire's got to break through and get to the Final Four because it's Duke. Yeah, I, I think that's – I don't know that that is even the – if that's the expectation in Kentucky right now. 
uh, because of how bad, you know, Coach K wasn't as bad in the NCAA tournament as Coach Cal was late in his Kentucky tenure. So I think even winning a tourney game in year one would be huge for Kentucky this year. But I am with you, you know, second round put out for Shire and then Elite Eight. That's good for Duke. I don't think the expectations are that high right now for Kentucky. But they're going to get there when they get talent. And he's going to get talent. I think anybody who coaches at Kentucky is going to be able to recruit. And once he starts getting talent and they're picked to win the SEC preseason or finish second or third and they disappoint, then the pressure is going to be turned up. Chad Withrow's with us from Outkick. It's hot seat time. we got a lot of NFL draft on the hot seat, so we will do that next. Tell and company on a Fireball Hot Take Friday. You know I love Fireball whiskey. That's right. No better way to start off the weekend than to do so by igniting the night and igniting it with ice-cold Fireball cinnamon whiskey. I love Fireball whiskey. It goes down so smooth and it tastes so great. There is no better way to get in and enjoy than and to start the weekend than with ice-cold Fireball cinnamon whiskey. So if you're out this weekend, be sure to order up some shots of Fireball. That's Fireball Sin Whiskey night tonight. Please do it responsibly and be 21 years or older to enjoy. That's Fireball Sin Whiskey live from the Jackalope Brewery. Stillman and Company, 1025, 106 through the game.
Time to take a look right now at our leaderboard, our Augusta leaderboard, which is presented by Burger Republic. That's right. Come on out and uh, enjoy Burger Republic as they've got the Green Jacket Burger. That's right. So be sure to enjoy that. Uh, again, for a limited time, a true master's experience. Taking a look at the leaderboard, Scotty Scheffler through 11 is the leader at 7-under. Meanwhile, Bryson DeChambeau and Oma are done for the day, both at 6-under, tied for second. Chad Withrow is with us here on the program from Outkick. Time for the hot seat. Chad, do you have a thought or do you want to go right to the seat? Let's get right on to it, the hot seat. Let's go. Okay, number one, you are the Tennessee Titans. Malik Neighbors is on the board at seven, as is Joe Alt. Do you take the elite touchdown scorer or the elite non-touchdown scorer? This is a no-brainer for me. You take the elite non-touchdown scorer because it is the biggest need for this Titans team. So take Joe Alt, plug him in at left tackle, and, and roll. Because you signed Calvin Ridley for a reason. And it wasn't to take Malik Neighbors with the seventh pick. If Joe Alt is there and available, I think you've got to address offensive line first. And uh, I hope that's what the Titans end up taking. Who would you rather have? Joe Alt at seven or Olu Fashnu plus an extra second and fourth round pick for trading down? Um, I'd probably take Fashnu. Uh, but only because, and I, I'm trying to read through, you know, I'm, I'm reading through Dane Brugler's The Beast and, and different things, and I, I am not someone who's going to sit here and say that I can watch the film on, on left tackle or tackles and evaluate and tell you which one's better. Um, they seem to be pretty close. Joe Alt is clearly number one, but there's not an enormous drop-off between him and Fashionu. So I, I think I would go with the extra pick, given all the Titans needs, and taking him further down the line in, in the draft. So uh, give me the big tackle from Penn State and more draft picks. Okay. Would you consider a right tackle with the seventh overall pick, J.C. Latham, Thales Fuwaga, or is it strictly left tackle in the first round? I think it's Joe Alt or trade back uh, would, would be my option. Like, I think you, you, get, you get Joe Alt, get the left tackle if he's there. I would not take a right tackle in that spot. I'd work really hard to trade back in that scenario. I mean, I guess Malik Neighbors comes back into play at that point if he's there and uh, you can't trade back. But I, I would not go right tackle. I, I would go I, – I do like the idea of going left tackle, right tackle with your first two picks. But I'm going left tackle in that top ten spot. If not, and if my, my guy at left tackle isn't there, I'm trading back and getting more picks. Okay, Charles Robinson went on Robbie and Rex Road yesterday – and said that J.J. McCarthy is very much in play for the number two overall pick and that New England may have J.J. McCarthy number one overall on their board. Do you believe that? I mean, I believe it if he's reporting it because he's a good reporter. Do I buy that he's the number one overall pick in this draft or that he's that good? No, absolutely not. We were not talking about J.J. McCarthy like this at all during this season. I'm always reluctant to go with the guy who's the flavor of the month because he gets to a, a pro day or he gets to the combine and suddenly, oh boy, he's a lot better than we thought for a guy who, uh, you know, in his offensive mission, basically handed the ball off uh, most of the time there. So, no, I, I'm not buying that. Now, I do buy that he's going to be, you know, the fourth quarterback taken and he's going to go in the top five or six picks the way it's, it's shaking out. But, no, I, I don't think that uh, he's the number one overall pick. But if Charles Robinson says it, then he believes it, and he's reporting it that someone with the Patriots, you know, might have him at number one overall. But I mean, I'll, I'll be shocked if the Patriots go that route. Well, I so I believe that Robinson's is telling the truth. I just don't think there's any chance JJ McCarthy's number two pick of the draft. No, no, it's it's going to be it, it's looking like Caleb Williams, Jaden Daniels. Then there's going to be a toss up between Drake May and, and JJ McCarthy for the next one to go. But no, I, I don't see that happening at all. Why do you think people accept the narrative that, well, they didn't ask J.J. McCarthy to do a lot in the offense when Jim Harbaugh, the head coach, is a quarterback? If the quarterback was good enough to do those kind of things, you let the quarterback do it. Would Jim Harbaugh have told Peyton Manning, hey, man, turn around, hand the ball off every play? Well, I'll say this. They won the national title. 
So Jim Harbaugh played to the strengths of the team. Now, if you want to argue with me that, hey, well, why was J.J. McCarthy not a strength of the team? Okay, we can have that discussion. But I, I, I'm not going to sit here and say they did that because he's a bad quarterback. I think they did that because they had a great offensive line. They had a great running game, and that's how they were built. They were a trench-built team, offense and defense, and they loved to run the football. Uh, that's no slight to J.J. McCarthy. I, I also just don't think it's something that we can sit here and say, but it's number one pick in the draft worthy. They just decided not to throw it because they're a run-first team. I, there's something off with that. I think Harbaugh did the right thing, clearly, and won it all. But I never saw this ability to be a top-five pick with J.J. McCarthy. Do I think he's a late first-rounder? Yeah, I think that's what I probably thought of him at Michigan, late first round, second round maybe, but not a not a top three, top five type guy. But that's apparently the flavor of the month and where people are projecting him now. Brian Callahan asked about wide receiver depth after signing Calvin Ridley, mentioned Kyle Phillips, Nick Westbrook Akine, and Mason Kinsey did not mention Traylon Burks. And in a sit-down with Rand Carthon and Mike Keith, was asked about how Ridley and Hopkins can help Burks. And he said that he can watch how those two guys operate as pros. Talked about the pictures as well. Do you think Brian Callahan is disappointed or worried about Traylon Burks and his weight this offseason? Well, first off, the pictures you sent, I can't tell a big difference uh, between one picture to the next. I'll have to take a closer look at that. But here's where I believe that he probably is a little bit bigger and out of shape right now. Because the dude showed up to his first ever training camp out of shape. And they blamed it on asthma. He was fat and out of shape in his first training camp. Do you know, Jared, when I knew Traylon Burks was a bust? It was the day he couldn't finish a drill in, in minicamp when that happened. When he showed up that way, I, that was a huge red flag. And it has not gotten better. So while I don't see a big difference in this photo that you sent from now to last time, I, I totally buy that he's not in the best shape and that he is a bust because that's what I thought about him then. And that's what I'm thinking about him right now. And that's what Brian Callahan seemingly thinks about him with his comments. So do you think that when Brian Callahan just doesn't mention him, I I said it means one of two things. Either it means that he's trying to motivate Burks by showing him that he doesn't care about him, or he just doesn't care about him. And neither are probably good for the play. Well, I, I think, I think a couple things also one, I do think when you're a head coach, it is a good practice to mention as few individual names as possible when talking about your team, especially in the NFL, because you know who you have and you know who's good. If you're asked a specific question about a guy, and I like this about Callahan. You know, he's not Mike Vrabel. He's not really playing games or trying to make someone look stupid. He'll answer your question. And uh, he's done that so far. If you're asked a specific question about a guy, you answer it. But in talking in generalities, you want to name your leaders and no one else. Traylon Burks is clearly not a leader. Uh, for the wide receivers. So um, I, I don't think it's good to just go down the roster because then you get this game of, oh, if you're in the locker room, he didn't mention me. What does that mean? You know, he didn't, say, he didn't say my name. If you mention too many, then you leave one guy out, suddenly it becomes a, a much bigger thing. I don't think he mentioned Traylon Burks, honestly, Jerry, because he's not really thinking about Traylon Burks right now because he's not giving him a reason to think about him. I mean, he is looking surface level at his team as they have it now going into the draft. And the two considerations he's really making, to me, and these are the only two I'd make also, Hopkins, Ridley. That's where you start. That's your base. Build out from there. Traylon Burks has to go out there and earn it and prove something. Okay. Who will win the divorce between Calipari and Kentucky? Boy, if it was going to be Scott Drew or one of those guys that threw out Nate Oates, I would say Kentucky. But I'm going to go Arkansas now. I think John Calipari looks a lot better when you look at his resume and what he did at Kentucky and now that he's in Arkansas, considering who they just hired. I think Mark Pope could be a good coach for Kentucky, for Kentucky, but I know what John Calipari is going to do. And what he's going to do is what he showed at that press conference. New energy. He looked 10 years younger in that press conference. He looks fired up, ready to go. He's going to get on the recruiting trail. He's going to sweet talk some parents and some kids. He's going to get them in there. And they're going to win pretty quickly. 
And by pretty quickly, I mean this year, because he's going to take most of his recruiting class with him uh, from Kentucky eventually. So uh, I think that Calipari and Arkansas are going to win this divorce. Last one for you. How many SEC basketball jobs are better than Arkansas's? <laughs> oh, man. Kentucky? Uh Honestly, Tennessee and Alabama are in consideration. That's it. Uh, I think I, I think after Kentucky, if you look historically at wins, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jared, it's Kentucky, Alabama, Tennessee are one, two, and three. Now, Arkansas didn't mm-hmm. join the conference until 1992, and after they joined the conference, Nolan Richardson won a national title, and they were a powerhouse in the 90s. So I really think that's, that's the group. I think it's. Kentucky one. I'm going to go with Tennessee two, uh, based on recent history. Even though Arkansas has been really good with Muslim too, it's, that's a tough one. I, I don't know. I, I'm going to go. I'm going to go Kentucky one, Tennessee two, Alabama three, Arkansas four. But I think you can make the argument that it's Kentucky and then Alabama, Tennessee, Arkansas are tied for for second. Here's what baffles me. It has always baffled me. How the hell is Georgia not better at basketball? I don't understand I've that never either. understood that. Never understood that. With the Atlanta metro area right there, you get right. two guys from that city that you want every year. You are in the tournament every single year, and they have so rarely been relevant at all. It's crazy to me that Georgia's not been better. Another one I'll put in there is Vanderbilt. I think if Vanderbilt figures it out with, with Byington, you know, they could be one of the better SEC jobs because of the city they're in. Chad Withrow on the hot seat. Chad, great stuff as always. Fun times, Jared. Have a great weekend, everyone. Yep, Chad Withrow joining us on the program. We are live once again at the Jackalow Brewery where they have just unveiled the Fred's Beer Mural. And they will, again, Nash is here. The Energy Team is here. The Predators Foundation's here. 20% of Fred's Beer Draft sales will be donated to the Preds Foundation. So come on out today because they've got all kinds of stuff. they got a food truck that's here, Taqueria El Gima out here, and then, of course, the game at 7.30 tonight. Stillman and company, speaking of the Preds, Hal will join us next, 1025-1063 the game.
gentlemen and company, we are live out again at the Jackalope Brewing Company out here located in the heart of Wedgwood, Houston, where, again, they have unveiled the Preds mural. That's right. They have unveiled it here again at Jackalope Brewing Company. We got Nash out here. We got the energy team. Everybody's out here. Everybody is all excited as they get set again for what is one of the final three games the purgatory stage of the season and the predators are again getting set to take on the blackhawks tonight hal gill joins us on the program presented by okay great hal gill joins us uh presented by duncan as he's already in the booth Hal, i didn't know if you were in the booth or not good to hear from you as again we're live out of the jackalope brewing company so i want to start with this hal i want to start with the last three games of the year Put yourself in the skates of these players, knowing that a Vancouver is coming up, knowing that maybe Edmonton, Dallas, who knows? How do you approach these last three games knowing you're already in the playoffs? Yeah, it's tough. It's a it's a challenge because you're given everything you got. How about that comeback, right? I mean, they gave it everything they got against the Jets to, to get that point. And so now you're looking at this, okay, does this game really matter? Well, yeah, it does. You know, you, you want to try to win out. You want to go in on a hot streak and want to be playing well. I think the, the bigger, bigger focus is when you're, when you're out there, you got to go as hard as you can. You got to play the right way. There's no avoiding blocking shots. There's no not taking a hit to make a play. You have to play the right way. But I think uh, the coaches are, are – are, are aware of what everyone's going through and they're going to manage the minutes. So when you're out there, you play hard. And I think going into the playoffs, you're going to have, don't forget, they're going to have like seven days off. It's a long time, Monday to Monday, that they're going to be waiting. And so they're going to get their rest. Right now, I think they need to clean up the game. I think that's got to be the focus is go four lines, 60, and, and play the right way. How do you feel about that Monday to Monday or Monday to Sunday or whatever it ends up being for the Predators? Because, I mean, Corey Curtis was on the show earlier today, and he's like, he goes, I he thought the team was worn out, that that point streak and everything else, that it kind of wore the team out. Trot said on Tuesday that he felt like the St. Louis game last Thursday, you know, that the Predators were kind of low on the batteries uh, last Thursday. So is that Monday to Monday, is that good for the team? Or is that bad because, you know, they're not going to be in the flow of playing hockey? Yeah, it's good until it, it, until you're too rested, right? And I think that's yeah. practice has to be managed the right way. And um, I think it'll be a good opportunity for them to practice fast, practice hard, uh, but then you're still getting rest. You're not taking, you know, the block shots for, that you do in games. You're not taking the hits that you would in games. And so uh, I think you, you have to be honest in practice and go hard so that you're ready when, you know, the playoffs, so when, when it picks up. Uh, that first game, uh, the first series is electric and fast and hard. And so, you know, you got to go out there and, and you got to be ready for it. So rested is great. Rusty is not so great. So the, there's a balance there that they have to find. Al Gill with us presented by Duncan. So is there a particular opponent? Again, the Predators really can't control what happens, you know, between Edmonton and Vancouver, and, like, they can't control that. So my question to you is, like, if you could pick between Vancouver, Edmonton, or Dallas, is there an opponent that you'd like to play? And is there an opponent that you say, you know what, this matchup may not be great for the Predators. How do you handicap it? Yeah, it, well, first of all, if you, if you start – picking and choosing who you want to play it usually turns around and backfires you know you're like okay i think we can beat this team we'll beat these two guys for sure and, and then, then they you, kick your you ass get them and then they kick you you know and so you you can't pick it you got to go out and play the right way and hope that you know the stars align for you and you get a good matchup but i think if you look at the teams you know each one has their different challenges you know like i i, I think if you're playing against dallas with a bigger defense core as opposed to Vancouver, that's a different challenge. If you're, you get Edmonton, you're looking at Connor McDavid and, and Leon Dreisaitl, and you're saying, okay, how, how are we going to balance that and, and manage those guys? Um, so I think each one has a different challenge, but I don't think there's there's anyone 
that I, I hey these are all the best teams in the league for a reason they they know how to win and so I think either one is going to be is going to be tough I mean that's the bottom line so um I think if I'm in the Preds locker room I'm worried about my game and what I'm doing rather than worrying about their game you're going to have that meeting uh, that that talks about what they do and their tendencies and how they play and you're going to make a game plan to go against that but each team that we're looking at is good for a reason and you just got to find out what that reason is and try to shut it down Hal, do you buy in at all to the idea that if this team was going to go on a run that the shorter travel with dallas would be a better matchup than say going to vancouver or edmonton flying back and forth and then being matched up with vegas or the other team in the second round and the flying back and forth or as a player, does that not matter? Uh, yeah, that that does matter. I, I think that's that's one of the the problems about playing in the West. You know, you, it's a haul. You know, there's not too many quick flights. You, you know, like if if you're a, sure. a Rangers Islanders matchup, that's that's a heck of a lot easier on your body to play those those series. And so uh, it is certainly a challenge. Now, you, you weigh it out, you know, is it another hour between Vancouver and Edmonton? That Maybe that doesn't make as big a difference. Um, so, I, I, But a Dallas is certainly a shorter flight. And so it, it, it makes a difference, but every team has to do it in the West, unfortunately. It's, it's just part of the business. Hal Gill is with us. What do you make of the fact that, you know, Evangelista has just absolutely been buzzing lately, but he really hasn't been getting the puck to go in the net as much as he's been generating opportunities. Is that kind of one of these situations where, hey, you know, like in baseball, for instance, the coaches would be happy because, hey, you know, he's hitting the ball well. He's just hitting it right at the fielders. Or is there a concern yeah. that, hey, he can't get this puck in the net right now? Yeah, you start to worry when you don't get looks. But, um, he's, I mean, he's playing hard right now. And sometimes I think uh, the harder you play uh, – you look at goal scorers, sometimes they need to relax when they get into the scoring area. You work hard to get into the scoring area, but then your your skill takes over, and it's not hard work anymore. It's just that finesse and that finishing touch. I think there's a couple times where I've seen him, you know, he, he, he has a look, and he just tries to fire it past the goal. He tries to rip it top shelf where maybe he could pump fake and move it, and he did that uh, the other night. What do you have, 10, 10 chances and, yep. you know, he had one move where he faked the shot, brought it to the backhand, and then he had another hot goalie make a big save. And, and so th- I think you kind of have to deal with that, and you go through those times, um, and you see goal scorers do that. But I think the fact that he's getting all those looks is, is fun to watch, and, and it's impressive right now. So I asked Barry Trotz about this on Tuesday, and Barry, I thought, you know, was kind of, I don't say dismissive of this, but Adam Vingen pulled a stat that the Predators during the winning streak were allowing about four and a half slot shots per game, and now they're averaging about eight-plus slot shots per game. And, I mean, that third Winnipeg goal, guys guys had like four goals on the year, is wide freaking open in the slot, and I'm not sure there's much UC Soros can do about that. Why are the Predators allowing so many high-danger opportunities of late when they were so good, you know, while things were going well for them. Yeah, well, I think they have a fluid defense, and the way that they shrink the zone and come back and and try to not just get stops in the D zone, but but create motion and create offense and move forward while they're doing that D zone shrink. And I, I think if it, if one guy is out of whack, if one guy isn't quite there, you're going to give up those chances. So I think it's just a matter of, and, and that's in large part why I think they need to clean up their game in these last three games is because they want to take those away. And, and you need to have five guys on the same page so that, you know, when you're moving through the D zone and you're, you're you know, as a centerman, all the centers have said this, this system takes a lot of skating. You have to get used to it. And over the year, they've, they've really done a great job with the system. But when it's a little bit off, you're going to see those chances. The, the upside is, you know, it, when you're on – it's really hard to play against, and when when you're you know you're doing it right, you're creating offense from the D zone. And so with the, with the stretching wingers, and how many times have we seen Luke Evangelista blow 
explode to the far blue line and get a pass and an outlet pass. Uh, that defensive structure is giving them offense, but when it when it slips, it, you got to catch it quick. And so I think they need to clean that up, and I think that would probably be a focus uh, for these last three games from Bruno. Hal Gill with us. Hal, tomorrow the Predators are going to have fan appreciation night. They're going to have a party on the plaza. Are you going to be on the plaza tomorrow before the game between 5 and 5.30? I, I will be out there. Yeah, we, we're, we're set up. Lindsey, Riley, and I will be set up there. We'll be all fired up. I know it's going to be the uh, last home game. It's going to be fun. So I will be participating in the dunk tank tomorrow night on the Bridgestone Arena Plaza oh. from oh, 5 God. to 5.30. And I got to be honest with you, if there's anybody who I like, when I think about the opportunity to <laughs> chuck a fastball to throw me into the dunk tank, my dad asks me how, why you still come on this show. So if there is anybody <laughs> out there that I think should take advantage of that, that's you. So you're going to get your shot tomorrow. Are you going to take it? I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Absolutely. I, do I have to throw a ball or can I just go punch it? Well, I know you. And so <laughs> I know what you're going to do. I'm going to throw gonna, an absolute dime of a heater. And you're going down. You're going to try to I do just like, don't... you know, yeah, I, I'm an athlete, you know, and I'm talking about what you're going to say. I'm an athlete. You're going to throw it. You're going to miss. And then because you're going to be mad that you missed, you're going to come up and you're just going to hit. I already know. Yeah, but a blunt force in, instrument, you know, I got to go in there and use it. Just so I don't want make sure you don't have a speedo. No one needs to see that, Jared. Thong bikini? <laughs> Please, no. Please, no. If they set up a, uh, a, beer, a beer dunk tank, let me know. I'll, I'm, I'll participate in that one. I will say this. I did a dunk tank a couple years ago, and it was some of the most disgusting water I've ever been in my entire life. I oh, mean, yeah, yeah, it yeah. is just beyond, you know, well, it's just awful. Yeah, it's one of those I'll you want to go first. You, you want to go first, pre- right? <laughs> you want to be the yeah. first one that goes. <laughs> yes, always want to be first. <laughs> Hal, appreciate you. We'll see you tomorrow night. We'll see you on the TV broadcast tonight and, of course, calling the game with Pete Weber right here on 102.5 and 106.3 The Game. How? we're almost to the playoffs, baby. We're almost there. This is exciting, right? This is it's, this is the time of year. Beautiful weather out. We got some hockey and going to playoffs. Let's do it. Well, and, and to that point, I mean, I, I know that we're going to run here, but Barry Trott said the other day, you know, hey, this team has nothing to lose, and, you know, there's going to be more pressure on the other teams, and he's not wrong about that. I found it odd that that was kind of his approach, but – you know, when this team was good, like when this team was a President's Trophy or a 100-point Central Division, there was like an anxiety that came with the playoffs. I feel that going into this. It's almost like, hey, they're going to be underdogs against Vancouver, Edmonton, or Dallas. Let's see if they can beat them. And if not, then let's figure out what they have to do in the offseason to beat them. But I'm not going to be, you know, going crazy. In it. Well, I shouldn't say that. I might. But you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. No, you know what? Talk to the guys in the locker room. It, it's It's – it's actually interesting. They are really focused on the process. I don't think they're – without the pressure, you're not worried about winning. You're worried about going out and playing the right way and see what happens. And I think that's a, a healthy mentality. You know, like you, you're not worried about, you know, the win at the end of the day. You're worried about doing all the right things and giving yourself a shot to win. Hal, take care of yourself. See you tomorrow. You got it. Cheers. Yep, Hal Gill presented by Duncan. Again, live from the Jackalope Brewing Company where Nash and the energy team and they've unveiled the mur- the mural and they got the Preds beer and the money's going uh, 20% to the Preds Foundation. Predators game day's next. Stelman and Company, 1025, 106 for the game.
All right, Predators game day presented by TJ Anderson Homes of Benchmark Realty online at tjandersonhomes.com. Get your house seen, heard, and sold with TJ. The Predators are 45, 29, and 5, good for 96 points. They're in the playoffs. The Blackhawks are very, very far away from the playoffs at 23, 50, and 5. Good for 51 points. It should be noted UC Soros not playing tonight. Who knows what that's related to? But Max... We'll have everything for you coming up next. Preds Extra leading into the pregame show. 7.30 puck drop. Special thanks to everybody out here at the Jackalope Brewing Company for having us today. Stillman & Company, enjoy the games. We'll see you Monday at 2.00.